Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the O Gaming Nation Wars, brought to you by Daily Motion and Numerical. And it's my pleasure to invite once again the one and only Snoote to the show. It's not Snoote, it's Snoote. God damn it! <laughs> it's not so important. You can say Snoote. Uh, That's fine. Norway. Well, we've been screwing up Zocker's name for the last four years, so I think we can get away with it. Oh well, never mind. So, you put on a really good performance initially, and then, unfortunately, you weren't quite able to make it happen against Russia. Almost. Almost, but not quite. So, now you're actually in a rematch, once again. So, yep. I have to wonder, you did really well in the first series, and but that was... I think it's safe to say, off the back of one of your fantastic Protoss players. So, are That's you going to be able to pull out again? Or will this be something that you have to get more directly involved in? Um, I think the uh, biggest mistake in the match against um, Russia was sending me before Aiki. That was a huge blunder. Uh, so I think for this match we will be a bit more intelligent with our decisions. That was just a really bad move by us. So hopefully this match will be a bit better. Oh, Greg finally got his answer. Fantastic. He'd be Greg had been looking for an answer as to why you decided to go out on Polar Night there. Yeah, uh, I was going to go out on Polar Night anyway, but uh, sending me before Aiki was not the best move since Happy has had a really good record against me. So that was just a really bad human mistake, I guess. All right, well, there's the explanation for that, so that's always good. All right, well, a rematch. Are you feeling more confident or less confident now that you've, I suppose, shown the capability and the sort of builds that Aiki likes to do? Well, I think um, even, uh, how should I say this? After watching Spain versus Poland, I wasn't really that impressed. So ah, okay. <laughs> I think we can take this easy. All right, good. Even if they know our strategies and stuff, I think it's fine. Okay, Snooter, thank you very much, and uh, we will be going into Die Star versus uh, Targa very shortly here. Best of luck, and we'll be talking to Nurcio next from Team Poland. All right, we're just going to bring Nurcio on the call here, and we can hear from him, and then we can get into the final match of the evening, which should be pretty good, I think. It's going to be a fun match, to say the least. It'll be a rematch, as we saw earlier. And uh, there we go. We now have Nurcio on the call. Nurcio, welcome back. Yeah, hi. So, I gotta ask, what happened last series? I don't know, it was pretty crazy. Myself, I was playing like really sloppy. Both games versus like Vortex and... Uh, and the other Zerg, oh, Alastor. And, well, I like ZVP on Frost. But I don't like close spots, and unfortunately, I spawn like 80% of the time close spots on Frost, and I win, well, not many of those games. So I don't know. I tried to do something there, but it clearly didn't work out. But fortunately for us, Mana could close down. Yes, he was certainly able to do that. Now, I've got to ask are you feeling more confident going into this rematch here against Norway? I think it will de uh, definitely be better than last time, but well, I can't really tell we're, if we're gonna win. It will be hard if, uh, and close, but uh, yeah, I think we have a better chance now. Were you surprised by Norway's strength? Uh, maybe not Norway's, but Aikis, or well, the pros player from Norway. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he definitely surprised everybody, I guess. All right, fantastic stuff. Well, Nurture, I won't keep you on the line any longer. We want to get into this because obviously we're running pretty late now in the EU, so we don't want to keep everybody up. But thank you very much for your time and best of luck. Thank you. All right, folks, there we go. Words from the uh, Polish team captain, Nurture, going into this final series here. One of these guys gets to go through to day three into the playoffs, the top four, and the other team will be eliminated. And frankly, there's a lot of pride on the line between these two. Now, we're going to have Die Star versus Targa coming up first here on Frost LE. Greg, I've got to ask. Die Star versus Targa. That that seems like a really odd, I suppose, matchup. That could kind of go either way. What do you reckon? Well, we saw it once already. They actually... <coughs> unless I'm... <coughs> excuse me. No unless I'm mistaken, they played in the first match between these two yep. teams. Or Targa actually did that 
silly little Ling Bane Ling rush. Dice Star just kind of swatted it away and then outmacroed him really easily. Um, I don't know. I This is on Frost. It's a much bigger map. I would say it's much better for Zerg, uh, particularly against Dice Star because both of the TVZs we've seen him play thus far, he's just purely done the Marine Rally kind of style. Uh, which is very much so dependent on brush distances. So if they get cross positions on Frost, or basically anything except horizontal close positions, it's quite hard to play that style, and that definitely seems to be Dice Star's bread and butter. So I think that would favor Targa, but we haven't actually seen Targa play a macro ZVT. We've barely seen him play a macro game at all, and mm -hmm. this is not a particularly good map to cheat ZVT on. No. So, I don't know, I don't feel like the map is very good for either of the players. I feel like Dice Star is kind of generically better, but not by a whole lot. He didn't look super impressive in that game against Alistar. So I, I'm kind of worried this might be another comedy of errors type match because he doesn't feel like it's well suited to either of their strengths. Yeah, I think you're probably right there. So who knows where this one could go? Guess we'll find out. Representing Poland to the southwest position in the Blue Trunks, it is Millennium's Dice Star versus his opponent to the southeast position. The team that shall not be named, representing Norway in the Red Trunks, playing Zerg and his Targa. I like that team. I hope he sticks with them. He was actually talking trash about Dignitas in the pregame lobby. Ooh. Kind of funny. Amusing. I don't think anyone from Poland is on Dignitas, so I'm not sure how that actually came up. So Targa kind of used to be, though. Yes, I, I would imagine that's why. Yes, I would think so. He left a few days ago. Oh, uh, but I believe Teffel just re-signed with Dignitas, so evidently Teffel's happy. Mm. That's good for Teffel. Indeed. Hard I remember Teffel. He was he was like one of the, the rising Zerg players, like around the time MLG started to do Why is Dice Star Blind? It's a great question. I don't I don't understand that comment. Uh, I remember Teffel was like one of the rising star players when MLG was starting to host their like the little things at their New York office. Yeah. And then he just never really did too much else. I remember he went to two or three of those and did pretty okay. Yeah. If I recall correctly, he also he was the player that went full Teffel against uh, I am MVP and uh, actually yes, lost the one game. game at that point. That, that was pretty funny. It to be fair, he was playing against MVP Mech. MVP Mech makes a lot of players look funny. <laughs> he just does he just does things that it's not really supposed to. Like first he went Mech when no one else went Mech, and then when everyone else started playing Mech, he started playing aggressive Mech and timing push Mech. Where it was like, no, you have to turtle if you play Mech. Apparently not. <laughs> He's probably one of the most embarrassing players to play against because he can literally do anything, and he's reinvented so many styles, or just invented so many styles. Like, you never know what you're going to play against. He's very good at catering it to a specific opponent, too. Yeah, I've got to say, so I was he... pretty happy to see him get a spot in WCS EU again after Duck Duck retired. Yeah. Yeah, it's good for him to stay in competition. He's always fun to watch. Even if he's not really top tier, he can always win against anyone, and it tends to be in pretty funny fashion, except yeah. for the person he's playing against. Well, you know what? They they can have a little bit of my pity, but I still want to be entertained, ultimately. <laughs> so it's, it's it's good to have MVP in a tournament able to do that. He's also so, he's always so gracious in defeat as well, which I really like about him. He's like he's just a seasoned professional. Oh, yeah, and an exceedingly nice guy. No one really has anything bad to say about him. Yeah, I'm still kind of curious why Dystar said he was blind. Well, apparently now he's deaf, so... He's gradually losing his senses as the game progresses here. Game Play StarCraft by sense of smell. <laughs> is sound really that important? I never play with sound in StarCraft. He it's just man up and stop delaying. Us. Funnily enough, it's very important for like a, a weak, like a lower level player because those sound notifications are kind of important. But for someone that knows what they're doing, I can't imagine it's that important to hear your drones are under attack because you've already got the minimap awareness to see that. I mean, unless you're playing against a Terran who's nuking. Basically what happens is I play without, I play with music on without sound until I get nuked the first time, and then I go turn sound off. <laughs> How often does that really happen these days? Not, not very frequently. No yeah. one makes Ghosts TVZ anymore, yeah, and I don't know why. So... They're still fantastic units. Really? Do you think so? Yeah. In that matchup? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Why is um, that? Actually, I guess no one makes Infestors anymore. Okay, I was, I was stuck in like six months ago when Infestors were still pretty popular, and you could just uh, ah, EMP it. Just pop them, them. yeah. But, I mean, Nuke Harass in itself is still good enough to justify making them. I suppose Fantastic is maybe a bit bit overstating it. But Nuke itself is very, very good and always has been and has always been the most underused part of them. Yeah, well, my... That's a very early... Oh, I was going to say, that's an early Spore Crawler, but no, that's just a, that's a morph to avoid the Reaper. But there yeah. you go. 
I just, I hope that that comment just makes people build nukes again because I am highly disappointed to not see nukes in pro play lately. I really think it's excellent harassment against Zerg if it goes to the late game. It's so hard to keep track of everything, and having the amount of detection necessary to actually cut off every possible route you could be nuked from is pretty much a practical impossibility. I mean, they're not even that expensive. I just, I really don't understand no. why they haven't been used for. I mean, I particularly at the end expensive. of the game where you're sitting on thousands of gas, it's like, well, I could build 30 ravens, or, you know, maybe a few nukes might help. To be fair, 30 ravens is, like, the scariest thing in the game right now. That is so. terrifying. I don't know about that. But yeah, I, I really think Terran players are just kind of lazy. They would like to just be able to sit and rally Marines and Widowmines across the map until the game is in, or until the game ends every single time. So in other words, they should play Zerg. Yeah, kind of. Except <laughs> usually it doesn't end so well for Zerg when we do that. Yeah, for Terran, it ends pretty well when they do the Marine Train stuff. That's unfortunate. And Dive Star is going for the immediate third CC once again. I think yep. this is the same build he's done every single game. Yeah, pretty much. I guess he, beat, he beat Targo with it once before, so he might as well. Why not? Yeah, playing straight up. Targo at the moment is also playing reasonably straight up. Nothing really out of the ordinary so far. He's still mining gas, though. And he's finished his metabolic boost. And he's, he's over 100 gas. gas, is not going lair. He's still mining gas, but it's not for anything particularly early. There hasn't been a Roche Warren, a Banley Nest, uh, an Evo yeah. Chamber. Maybe he just likes to build it up. Because normally what happens is you take the drones off gas, and then you take another extractor and put, like, six drones back on gas all yeah. at once. So maybe he just prefers to save up. And then we'll drop two Evo chambers in like a, kind of a little stylistic like a few thing here, maybe. Hmm. I think it's slightly less efficient, but it's not a big deal either way. But he's not dropping the Evo chambers, and this is the point where he's going to have 250 gas. Okay, well, he just the Evo chambers. Oh, right. well, he'll be able to start those upgrades almost immediately, which is nice for him. But so far, he's not really shown anything funky. Die Star showing the same kind of thing that we. Well, to be fair, I wouldn't even say Die Star's build. It was the same thing that Happy was kind of doing with his Hellions as well. Just building up a decent number of Hellions, throwing in a couple of Reapers. It's a pretty common thing for Terran to do. The follow-up behind that will be two additional barracks, but that's, of course, way after the factory. Another gas is being taken here by Die Star as well. And his third is rolling out quite early. He's confident that he can hold the map control with those Hellions. And for yeah. the moment, he's right. He's actually taking that third base very, very quickly. A lot yes. of Terrans would leave the orbital in their main, uh, just run off mules for a little bit longer. He's nowhere near saturation. No. There's no real need to take that third, but uh, obviously feeling very confident. And against Targa, feeling confident that you're not going to get attacked is often a misread. But in this case, in this specific situation, Targa is playing pretty defensively, pretty standard, normal, passive kind of gameplay. So it will be no problem at all for Die Star to hold on to that for the time being. Targa's also getting the worst end of these trades. He already lost a queen for nothing. It looks like he's going to lose a... Oh, almost lost a second queen. Takes out a Hellion at least, but... He's lost a lot of lings as well. This you know, this Hellion Harass has been very nice so far. It's kept Targa on his toes, and killing off a queen is definitely good, considering that means he doesn't actually have a spare queen for creep spread. Yeah, I don't know. Targa was kind of undercutting this a little bit. Not a whole lot of queens and not a whole lot of zerglings. Mm -hmm. You you really need one or the other, and he has neither. He's up to um, 60 drones already, so you know, he's been reasonably greedy in that respect. That is the payoff for it, but if he takes too much damage, it's not really worth it. You'd rather get the zerglings, then make a big round of drones, get up to 70-some, and be totally safe in the meantime. Yep. Well, the queens are now finally the number they need to be to push that back. As is, like you said, though, he lost a lot of time in terms of creep spread there. He actually doesn't have any active tumors out in front right no. now, which gets really, really dangerous when the follow-up marine medevac attack comes because you have no creep spread to try and get any kind of surrounds off. They just get right up next to your mineral line, and there's not really a whole lot you can do about it. Yeah, that's not ideal, is it? And uh, yeah, another good set of shots coming in here from Die Star. I've got to say I've been fairly impressed with his Hellion control up to this point. He's been doing really well, getting good shots off and trading efficiently. Like, he'll lose one here and there, but of course that's because those haven't been repaired, so they're going to die eventually, the queen shots, but... This has been okay for Die Star up to this point, and now he does have these three command centers. Five racks coming behind this, and an armory. All right. So, going super bio right now, and going straight into the 2-2. Two -two. Absolutely necessary for the whole marine train kind of style, and it does seem like that's what he's going to go for again. You really, really need the production to back that up. You need a lot of units constantly moving out, constantly reinforcing. Mm -hmm. And I, I mentioned before the game that uh, Targa really does not want to get close horizontal positions because that is the best position on this map for the Marine Train style. But he did get horizontal, so he's going to have to deal with that. However, he has plenty of Zerglings here, and he has a lot of Banelings on the way. 
not going to take any immediate damage. But once again, the Zergling counterattacks start, and let's see if Dystar actually makes a bunker this time. Yeah, that that was pretty embarrassing uh, last time I like we saw this, it. I like the supply wall, though. That's nice. That's it's quite a cute. supply wall. That is quite, quite the supply wall, yes, indeed. This could end up being the Great Wall of Lag here from Europe. But as it stands, there's, there's still a hole there, but it's not a particularly big one, so... Dystar is fine for the moment. He's got a couple of Marines behind that, so there's little run by aren't really going to do much. Dystar trying to engage again. He's he's being very, very rigorous when it comes to cleaning out these creep tumors. I would definitely respect that. That kind of thing is incredibly important for the style he likes to play as well. The, the less creep there is, the better. I, that's always true. Creep is always an important element of Zerg gameplay that you yeah. want to limit as much as possible. But if you're constantly attacking, you don't want to be fighting on creep. So keeping that creep back is of utmost importance. Yeah. I'm just overdoing the stim just slightly there with only two medevacs and fighting up against a half-done hatchery. Didn't really need to do that, but not really a big deal. Now producing 13 marines at a time and also going into mines. Drilling claws coming out pretty early on as well, which I like. That's something that he was a little bit slow last time. Tries to do a drop, doesn't really get anything done with it. So far, damage-wise to both players has been fairly low. Targa's attempts to take a fourth hatchery have been pretty much nullified so far by yeah. the the unit movement of Die Star, and that's getting to be problematic, but he is actually losing both those medevacs he had in the main to these mutas, so that, that compensates for it a little bit. Targa, and it, Targa look at actually Bainlings. looking for an attack here. Yeah, huge amounts of Banelings are being prepared there. Nice Widowmine shot, though, from Die Star, doing significant damage to that muta flock, but he actually allows one of his medevacs to die, but he loses a bunch of links in the process because he's too busy controlling this massive attack that's coming into the third base here. Huge amounts of Banelings invested to actually make this happen. The splits from Die Star have been pretty good. The mineral line will be sacked, but I happen to wonder at what cost because the Mutalist just died horribly there. I think that was way too big an investment for the payoff. That not pay off at all. He even uh, kept most of the SCVs alive. Oh, Jesus Christ. He, he, only, he only killed six workers. And he, yeah, just, he was... spent 4,000 minerals on that attack. Actually, more lost than that. his entire army, which was a Jesus. lot of mutas and banelings. It wasn't even just zerglings that he was throwing away there. And he I mean, he's only dead has, now, surely. He only has a 12 harvester lead. Yeah, I don't see any way he actually survives the counterattack here. I do not know what that was all about. <coughs> I mean, go, going after the third, spending that many banelings in that open an area to try and make that happen, just... He may be able to push this back, but with 13 marines at a time coming out and plus two, plus two kicking in... That's that's a tall order, I think. I and mean, it depends. Die Star may be able to also throw this game away, so we should never he underestimate is, that. He is quite quite good at that. I mean, he has proven his ability to throw much more one games, but that's not a good situation for Targa at all. Targa, no. he really likes just aggression. He likes attacking. That's kind of what he does. And he definitely didn't think that one through, or at least he didn't scout enough to see what kind of defenses Die Star actually had, because that was not a good engagement to take. But Dice Star also kind of just, he, he felt like he had an opportunity to go in for the kill there. But Target had good Didn't enough macro, good enough reproduction to hold him off. And that threw away a good chunk of the advantage because uh, Target still has a pretty solid economy. He is up by about 20 harvesters. He has a fourth base running and a fifth base on the way. He started to rebuild his Muta flock. That's honestly the biggest problem is he lost so many Mutas there. And having a good amount of Mutas is so, so important in the current... Uh, current mid-game CBT styles, because that's the only real way you can force uh, Terran to play very defensively. Muta counterattacks are so very powerful, but there's nothing Dice Star really has to worry about. He can just send units across the map with impunity at this point. Well, especially with that many mines, and uh, gotta be careful with those mutalists. The last thing you want to do is be hitting the mines. That minefield is actually very nicely spread out. I like that a lot. And in the meantime, a bunch of marines have been split up to try and deal with this. Plus two, they should be able to make their way through that quite easily. Interesting. Oh, looks like somehow, yeah, he, he took a little bit of damage there, but he takes the fourth out, so that's not too bad. He took, he ate a couple of banelings here and there. The widow mine field is still quite dangerous. He's decided he wants to pull that back, though. That's probably pretty smart of him. He lost quite a few marines there, uh, actually running back and forth trying to kill that hatchery and trying to pressure. His multitasking just wasn't up to the job, and he lost quite a bit. Yeah. So smart to pull back, regroup, actually make sure he has enough units to defend his widow mine so he doesn't lose those needlessly. And he is nearly maxed, so he should be moving out pretty quickly here. He's approaching plus three weapons, plus three carapaces, is quite far away. But on target side of the map, he doesn't even have a hive started yet, so those three three upgrades are a distant, distant dream for him. And if Dysar really wants to, he could just wait for at least some plus three weapons, but it looks like he's going to get aggressive before that. Well, and let's see is, what happens with that. 
This is kind of where he lost the game against Alex. Oh, right? so, all the Winter Mines got killed. All the Winter Mines got killed before they detonated. That's an absolute disaster for Die Star. Oh, we got to see yet another throw. There are, however, more Winter Mines deployed. A lot of the Banelings get hit, but not all of them in here. And this entire defensive line has come to pieces. However, the reinforcements come in from Die Star and push it away. This really is turning into a game of throws. Yeah, that was pretty bad on both ends. Uh, that initial engagement from Die Star, just, well, it wasn't even an engagement. He just got caught, lost yeah. a lot of stuff. But then Targa, uh, kind of like Alistair was in the previous games, he just say he thought he saw an opportunity, but Die Star, he managed to split just well enough. Plus, he had some Widow Mine set up. He had a four coming in that gave him a lot of extra tankiness. Yeah. This wasn't enough. Solid but play run certainly. by them. Yeah, certainly run by is everywhere, actually. Multiple pronged attacks. I start going to be able to defend the bottom base, but taking a lot of SC damage. SCB damage is third. And not really killing enough units to compensate for it. He didn't manage to catch the army down bottom. He just yeah. drove it away. Some lengths even got to the main that are being incredibly annoying there, just trying to pick up an SCB or two. So, target with a nice bit of aggression there, and Die Star. Well, let's just say his wall being on one side didn't really help him all that much. There was no wall on the other, so. That didn't work out at all. The Muta account is now going in there. Oh, and that, that could have been nice, but he ran it right into the bunker there. And I think that Dystar has now noticed because he could have perhaps caught that transfer. But he eats a couple of Thor shots for his trouble and ends up being pushed back across the map. In the process, though, he's actually managed to secure that fourth base. And that's about complete now. Now, that actually ended up being his fifth base. He has he took the bottom left as ah, yes, he did. the central map. Yeah. So he's been running on fourth base for a little bit. But yeah, securing that fifth base. The big thing, though, is he's not even, like, he hasn't even started his hive yet. He has the infestation pit. Hive's not on the way, which means he's fighting at 2-2, two -two, about to be against 3-3 three -three plus Thors, which means he's going to be incredibly inefficient in battles right now, unless he gets just baneling hits that should not happen. Uh, but I start unfortunately, has shown a habit of letting those baneling hits happen. Mm -hmm. So it's not completely hopeless for Targa, but Die Star's army is starting to get really risky. Yeah, that is true. All right, well, we're going to see a couple more Banelings morphed in. Those really kind of need to be cancelled now. No, that's... Uh, they did a little bit of damage, but not really too much. Die Star continuing to push forward. He has Thors. He's got Widow Mines. He's got about six of them. Maybe not as many as he wants, but those Thors will certainly help out an awful lot against this. And here comes some Banelings. There's a flank, though. A pretty good one at that coming in from the left. And he tries to crush this, but Die Star Split's actually really good here. The remaining Marines come in, and he's not quite able to. There's just so many Banelings that Die Star can't deal with it. That was... Uh, Die Star did not set up very well for that at all. He didn't have enough Widow Mines. He didn't have his Marines all together. And the ones that he did have were clumped, so they died really quickly to Banelink hits. He has a lot of units back at home that really should have been in there with that attack. You have to have everything together, because the Zerg army at this point is just so big, it can absolutely wipe you off the map if you let it. And, I don't know, Die Star, again, with just sloppy attacks, bad coordination. And this is starting to get to the point where Targa has a really, really scary mutable. He has a lot of economy going, he has a lot of reproduction ability, so even if he's fighting inefficiently, which he should be, uh, he might be able to make up for it with his production. Third base is going to take, well, fourth base, in fact, going to take significant damage. Might even lose the sensor tower. There's the stim, though, so Targa's probably going to want to get out of there. 3-3 three, three Marines against 2-0 Mutalisks, well, that only tends to go one way. The Marines continue to do damage at the fifth base and has actually gutted the mineral line quite nicely here, so Dice Star able to put on a little bit more pressure and get things back as the Lings finally come to respond to that incredibly slow response there from Targa, so he took a lot of damage there. He sent some Zerglings early on. It just it wasn't enough. Wasn't enough. Oh, oh, oh my! Wow. Oh! <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. Oh, that made my day. <laughs> well, he had a scary mutable. <laughs> so they have about equal army or about equal supplies again. I start going in once more. He's setting up a little bit better this time. He's keeping all of his marines together. He has more widow mines, but still an awful lot of bandits coming in. There are quite a few, I've got to say, but those Thors are, seem to be doing the job. In fact, there's three Thors there and a bunch of Marines. That might be the nail in the coffin here for Targa. He's doing a good amount of damage. The Widow Mine hit comes in behind. There's only two Mutalists left. There's the GG. Well, that was as entertaining as I'd hoped. Let me put it that way. <laughs> that was that was, that was the engagement that Dysar needed. He'd been looking yes. for that for the last, like, three push-outs, mm -hmm. and he finally got it. He finally had... I don't know. The biggest thing was he just kept worrying about that fifth base too much. He kept splitting off units to go try yeah. and kill that. And then he would lose his entire army in return for it. If mm -hmm. he had just focused on going for the jugular the entire time, I think that would have ended much quicker. I think so. But the 3-3 three, three upgrades and the Thors finally kick in. Which is too much to handle. 
Definitely, t it did take a little while to get there. They're, those losing all of those muters, I think, there was definitely the nail in the coffin. That was absolutely brutal. Mm. So many died. It was wonderful. <laughs> well, that's Targa out of the picture. So uh, that leaves us with the Polish lineup there. The so what am I talking about? The Polish lineup. He's Norwegian. What am I on about? The Norwegian lineup of Snooter and. I can't, I'm not sure if I even Ike. pronounce his name. Ike, Ike. I it is Ike, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know. Every time I so say it, I question myself, right. and I wonder if yeah. I'm just like completely misremembering it. It doesn't sound right, but but I guess it is. So, I mean, considering the performance, you can definitely say Targo is the weakest player on that squad at the moment. Admittedly, considering Snoot's only come out once and didn't, well, he kind of lost when he did. Yeah. It's hard to say whether or not Snoot's having a good day or not, so... Ike's still a good option, I think, especially against Dystar, and it wouldn't surprise me if they sent him out there. Admittedly, you might even want to send Snoot out because instead of sending Snoot out against Happy, where that's a it's a much worse matchup, you send Snoot against someone like Dystar, and I think Snoot wins most you of the time. You would think so, now. but I, I don't know. At this point, Ike actually kind of seems like the one who's carrying them. If anyone, he's, he's definitely the one doing more work. Oh, absolutely. You yeah. might want to hold on. Well, so I guess I'm actually agreeing, but you might want to hold on to him and just send Snoot out because you want to wear them down for Ike instead of actually just thinking that Snoot could win. Because Snoot's CVT, I don't know, it looked very suspect against Happy. Like, he scouted what was happening, he should have known, and then he just kind of made a lot of mistakes and got massively out multitask. Yeah. And Dystar, Dystar doesn't really seem like the kind of player who's going to out multitask you, but just it, he looked kind of weak, and I would worry about that. I don't know, I definitely think if they win, if they're going to win, it's going to be on the back of Ike. And against the likes of Nurcio, when his PVZ against Slipko looked pretty suspect. I don't know. I'm not liking their odds there. I, th I think... Okay, now that I think it through. I think they need to hold on to Snoot to have any chance of beating Nurcio. So they should send out Ike yeah. and get as much out of him as possible. And then they're going to have to cheese Nurcio. With yeah. Well, Dystar has already lost against Ike. And has lost fairly convincingly. Yeah, so. Ike versus Dystar. I think either of them against Dystar is good odds, but Ike would be the higher odds. I don't think Ike's going to lose to Dystar at all. Well, we'll see what they decide to do. We're getting the invite here to Yonsu, and let's find out exactly who Yonsu wants to Yonsu sounds do. like a better map for Snood if you liked Polar Knight, because that does not seem like a very suiting map for Ike. Not especially. But let's see who they decide to send. It's... It is... Ike. Ike. All right. So he's evidently got some kind of build up his sleeve for this one. And I mean, I he did Ike. massacre Die Star last time, so... I wonder if Ike means something in Norwegian. I should look that up. It'd be very exciting. It sounds very cute, so it probably means something that. anus or something. Probably. I, I, Ike Index Monday. Ike. It's a place. Ah. I wonder if that's where he's from. Possibly. It's it's near a thing that I think says Briskred. <coughs> something like that. My Norwegian is not quite that great. Skill at silly Scandinavian languages with their dots above oh, letters. Oh, God. I, I went to a place years ago that I still can't pronounce, even after years of trying. It's <laughs> And that was in Sweden. It was up north. I think the best time I've ever had listening to the news is when that big eruption happened in Iceland. Oh, uh, yes. Near that city. And listening to all the American newscasters trying to pronounce whatever that city was called. It was fantastic. It's just beautiful. Oh, wow. Apparently, Ike is near a city called Rammstein Krieger, which actually sounds very German and scary, but apparently not. That's awesome. <laughs> God, we, we have so, much, so many boring names for towns over here. Well, they're boring because we're used to them. Rammstein Krieg probably sounds pretty boring to them. That's, uh, that's, that's a fair possible. point. Admittedly, it's also boring because you stole most of your town names from England, and we were boring to begin with, so... Yeah. All our town names are like thousands of years old because of you guys, so yeah. it just can't be exciting anymore. Unfortunate. That and you just stick a new before most of them as well, which never <laughs> really helps. It's like, I've been to York. It's not even old York, it's just York. <laughs> it's it's an old town with lots of slanty buildings. That's really about as far as it goes. All right, here we go. So let's see what happens with this one. I am really interested to see whether Ike can, can continue the hype train. I am on the Ike hype train right now. And I'm hoping it's going to take me all the way to the end of the line. But we will see. To the southwest position on Yonsu. Playing for Carnage Esports and Team Norway. In the Red Trunks playing Protoss, it is Ike. 
versus his opponent to the northeast position, who's currently up one game for his team in this best of five team series, playing for Team Poland in the Blue Trunks, playing Tevin. It's Millennium's Die Star. I wonder what Ike's going to do on here, because this is a much more aggressive map than Frost, which is where his two previous PBTs were played. And on there he did, you know, the the gateway expansion forge, uh -huh. or a gateway ro gateway nexus robo forge, yeah. twilight council, and then adding three gateways all off two stalkers build. If he does that on here, I really feel like he dies to a lot of things. It's just such a small map. The natural is a little bit more wide open, and the ramp is very exposed to any kind of elevator shenanigans. I, I it would be incredibly risky if he opens up with the same kind of build here. On the other hand, Diastar, he's, he's pretty robotic. I'm not sure if he would actually respond properly in order to take advantage of him and kill it. Because if he does the same kind of three barracks build he did in their previous game, he can defend that on here just as well as he can on Frost. You yeah. would need to do some kind of quick starport build to really punish it, in my opinion. Totally. Well, let's see if Ike has another build up his sleeve beyond that massive amount of greed. Scouts coming out from both players, and no doubt Diastar would like to know what's going on. Try to get a read and see whether or not it's the same build coming at him. The, the concern that I've got whenever you run into a player like this that plays just in this ridiculously greedy fashion, I think perhaps the player who's playing against them has a tendency to overreact and say, oh, all right, well, he's playing greedy, so I should punish it. It's something you mentioned earlier, actually, saying, oh, well, he shouldn't be able to do that, so let's punish it. But they don't punish them quite hard enough, and then they end up dying horribly. The bigger thing is they often don't commit to it early enough. Like, with a lot of Protoss greediness right now in both matchups pvz and pvt but pvt in particular is it's really hard to just like to play reactively and to actually punish the greed because they're so powerful defensively yeah. with force field and all of the mothership core abilities plus just the generic strength and cost efficiency of their units it's really hard to do that so you almost can't just see it and then react to it with an attack you have to see it and react to it with your own greed uh because they're just so good defensively you have to really be committing to an all-in early on to actually mm -hmm. punish it. And I started actually scouting around looking out for proxies. So he he's not he's not pigeonholing Ike. He's not saying, no. okay, this guy is only going to fast expand. He's still looking out for the other possibilities. Just so that's that's good smart play from him. But in the meantime, Ike has actually gotten into the main of Dystar and sees absolutely everything. So he knows exactly what's going on. And he actually sees the fast factory, which could be pretty crucial. That definitely says that there is the possibility for a very quick drop, whether it be Widow Mines, Marines, Hellions, uh, even some kind of elevator or quick attack tactics. Yeah, I think so. And it's a little bit different from the last time we saw these guys go at it. Oh, nice pickup there from Dystar to grab the probe so it doesn't get out, but... Last time we saw Diestar throw down three more barracks and not even consider the factory and then just outright lose. I think it makes more sense just to play a solid style against Ike. So far, ah, well, Ike is actually shaking it up here. He's adding two more gateways, which is very unusual for him. I like that, though. I think that's a very smart response here. I don't think doing the, the same build that he had done would be at all safe yeah. on this map, especially against a quick starport build, which he scouted. Um... I mean, he could have still dropped the Robo. Getting that quick Observer out is also quite good against Widow Mine drops. But going up with three gateways, he's going to have quite a few units. He's going to be very ready for that. And if Dice Star messes up, if he loses too much trying to commit to aggression against a player he thinks is being greedy, then 3 gate can easily, easily transition into a counterattack. And we already see a pylon coming up uh, from Ike further out on the map to set up for that possible counterattack. So I think this is a really smart play from Ike. Yep. We should also point out that I believe Ike's first name is actually Ike, which might be why it's called Ike. Ah, uh, that could but, be it. But I still believe that it is a mystical town near Rammstein Krieger, because that just well, sounds maybe, better. Maybe he's Ike from Ike, and yes. then it's just like a given name. Absolutely. Oh, and Dystar actually finds the pylon, shuts it nice. down, and he killed the probe as well. Yeah. So there is no, no available warp in and no potential available warp in for Ike out on the map until he sends another probe out. But he is putting up a robo in a forge, so it looks like he's falling back to plan B. He did not commit much at all to the Borkgate uh, tactics, mm. which might actually be a mistake, because we have a full medevac coming out, as well as seven or eight marines out on the map. So this is actually a kind of scary attack, and there's only two stalkers in a zealot there. The Mothership yeah. Corps can compensate for a lot, but maybe not that much. Well, he does almost have enough energy for two photon overcharges, so if it decides to be a double-pronged aggression, then he may be able to pull it off regardless. I am still a little bit worried, though. This can go wrong. 
Dystar is actually dropping on the top of the ramp here to give himself some vision, but he is gonna lose the medivac! And he does so and loses even a unit in it. The zealots get their hands on that as well, but up the ramp he goes, and that is a very, very, very late, but apparently, ultimately, it doesn't matter in any way, force field. Really nice uh, focus fire on the dropship, just good re- or the medivac, just just good solid that reaction from Ike. It was kind of a weak medivac. attack from- sorry, what? I was going to say that uh, the defense from Ike was just great. I mean, he lost, what, two zealots, and that was it? Two zealots, yeah, he didn't actually even lose a sentry. He is no. about to lose some probes to a widow mine down there, though. Uh-oh. Ooh, two. Ah, okay. Two probes. But good reaction is still there from Ike. He recognized that it was coming. He saw it, or he had it timed out, and he saved a good chunk of probes. He's really just playing this quite well in general. And here comes the Robo Bay. He's got plus one going. He's just headed up. Uh, towards that macro game once again, and he definitely came out the better of that. I started invested quite a bit in that attack. That was a medevac, I don't know, maybe like 12, 13 marines, a widow mine, and, yeah. and delayed the rest of his production and uh, upgrades quite a bit. The two zealots and two probes, which is definitely yeah. not worth it. Not worthwhile. Plus he lost the medevac, so that really limits his continued harass abilities. That's very true. He's building a couple more course, but they're going to start on fairly low energy, and he might want to keep them at home, because who knows when something will come in his direction. As it stands, Ike's shown no wish whatsoever to get aggressive, but once he's got his extended thermal lance and a couple of Colossus, that's going to change a little bit. It also means that Viking production for Dystar is going to be slightly delayed. Losing one medevac means, hey, you know, I want to get a decent number of medevacs out, so I can only really build one at a time. And funnily enough, he's been building all of this without a reactor. He's only just getting his reactor done now for the swap over there with the factory. Yeah, that's pretty unfortunate for him as well. Uh, especially because he's seen Ike play a decent amount now. He should know he's very, very Colossus heavy. Yeah, Getting he those Vikings out should be an absolute priority. So I'm surprised he doesn't have a reactor on that starport um, a little bit earlier. Although he may not have had the resources to really run a reactor starport just yet. He is pretty low on gas, trying to catch up on upgrades after that kind of tech heavy opening. May not have actually been a possibility for him just yet. That's kind of the downside of the build. He didn't, and an empty medevac actually flying out on the map. I'm is this not for sure. Scouting? I mean, it's, it's got to be just for looking for pylons, right? I would imagine so. Maybe he just doesn't realize it's empty. And he is bringing it back towards his army now, so he was probably just looking for pylons, which is a pretty smart play from him there. Yeah. So many Terrans just don't even think of that and then lose to just prolonged zealot warp and harassment as they try and attack. It looks like Ike is thinking about a third base. Dice are moving out with really good timing to make sure that doesn't happen. However, two Colossus on the field and no Vikings actually with the army. So he definitely cannot attack and he has to be pretty careful about engaging at all. Well, one thing we have seen from Ike is that his force field control is not that great. So maybe he lets the 11 Marauders through and then they murder everything. But aside from that, yeah. it seems unlikely. So not sure how that Marine got up there. I think he just, he had a, a leisurely jog up there while the rest of the army drew it up and got a little bit of scouting information, did spot the Twilight Council, but, yeah, not hugely important. A drop coming in, but Ike is right on top of that. Oh, actually, that. two on top of that. His entire army is there. He's going to actually uh -oh. have to cancel his third nexus, most likely. A uh, little bit of an overreaction from him there, but Certainly. the first real miss that he's made. Yep. Single zealot. Oh, we didn't cancel. Didn't cancel, that's, wow. That's just an ideal. No, that's not good at all. And without Blink, he has no way to chase that drop down. So, Elki, uh, Elki, no, not Elki. <laughs> Ike is starting to fall apart a little bit. He is bringing in the stalkers around the side, and he may be able to get one of those medevacs, and he does, which is nice. But it, if it had units in, it would have been even nicer. Drop coming around the back, though, into the main here. But there is a cannon. Nicely. Oh, the full drop went off there. He lost the whole lot. That's that's pretty bad, especially because it looks like Ike kind of wants to attack. He kind of wants to do He's a Colossus. He's got three Colossus, he should. Yeah. And losing a medevac full of units when... Oh, and then losing two more medevacs full of units for no reason whatsoever. Wow. Wow. Dystar, Dystar kind of dropping the ball a bit here. He has some units back at home, but he realizes he's in trouble. He's putting up two panic bunkers, getting a bunch of Vikings. Uh, getting as many Vikings as he can. He's actually producing four at once, which is a good call against Ike. But losing that many units... That's just inexcusable. It's pretty brutal. Yeah. Army supply is actually dead even at this point, but it shouldn't have been. And the Protoss should have been on the smaller army, but that was not the case at all. And right now, unfortunately, it's looking like more die than star at this stage. <laughs> that it is. There are now four Colossus out on the field for Ike. Uh, no tech transition just yet. No charge slot. Nothing besides 
uh, blink and continued upgrades. So looking like he's sticking on that Stalker Colossus composition that he really likes uh, for quite some time. Uh, if he were scouting, I don't... His Observer does see the double Star Force, so I'm surprised he's not making a switch into more Templar from Ace Tech just yet. Sticking on Colossus for too long is going to be really dangerous for Assist, because there's going to be a lot of Vikings on the field shortly. Already quite a few, in fact. Yep. But he has no medevacs. He lost at, at least four medevacs so far this game, pretty sloppily, and he's been doing very heavy Viking production. So he has only two medevacs for his entire 150 supply army. And Man. that's that's pretty problematic. You threw a couple of storms in there, that would become ridiculous. Like the amount of damage you could do, plus stim and then Colossus attacks, the whole army would just be wiped out incredibly fast. And it looks like he's figured that one out too. He's throwing down a Dark Shrine and a Templar Archives because why the hell not? Let's get all the tech, right? And Charged up as well. Yes. Yeah. It's looking pretty good, although it is giving Dystar the possibility of actually building medevacs, so it's giving him some time here. He doesn't seem willing to do that right now. He's building 11 marines and millions of vikings at this point. He's actually got double starport up, but he's not building medevacs. He doesn't quite have the gas. Yeah, he, which is weird, because he's running on six gas. He has uh, he has started up his ghost tech, so perhaps it's that. He actually has... Um, Oh, pardon me. He actually has the army as well, so he's starting up his second tier of upgrades. So he's putting a lot of gas into other things, but I really think Medivac should be a bit of a priority. But you can't really blame him for the con continued Viking production, because we're up to five Colossus now. And Ike seems to stop at five, but until now, he has had just continuous Colossus production, so you kind of have to match that with the Vikings. But now Templar are beginning to be morphed in, a warp person coming out, so it looks like Ike is going into late-game Protoss harassment mode, getting ready to take his fourth base down at the bottom right as well. And Dystar is approaching a max. He's running on three bases. He has decent upgrades going. He has ghosts included. So this is this is your late game Terran army kicking in. Still only on two medevacs though, and no more in production. That that's just not acceptable. That's way too few. Yeah, that's actually ridiculous. The fact that he's almost maxed out and he's only on two medevacs. That I don't know. He's he's still building Vikings, continuing to build them. I mean, I mean he's got to go up to eighteen, which yeah, it's going to kill the Colossus pretty fast. But then what is it going to do? It's just going to sit there and watch as the Zealot Archon Remax just completely obliterates his Red Health army. Yeah. Three, three Colossus swipes, and the entire army is just worthless now. Yeah. All right, the engagement's going to happen in the center of the map right here. The charge, let's get in. They spot the number of medevacs, and that's probably causing a bit of a chuckle here from Ike, although he doesn't want to engage with his Colossus for fairly obvious reasons. He's drawing him back, spreading him out, pushing a single Colossus forward. All right, Ike on the defensive right now. This is a very tense situation. He's morphing in it. I love that. Great move. He d Oh, but the scan goes down. He spots which ones are fake, and he even takes out the Observer as well. So that, that was a nice little move there by Dystar. Didn't get fooled by the hallucinations. However, here comes the push. We Oh, looking for the blink pickoff. Takes out one. Where are the EMPs? We're not seeing them right now. He's not using any EMPs. The EMPs finally go down on some of the Colossus. It looks like he managed to take out some of the Templar as well. Of course, the Colossus died very, very fast, and suddenly will Ike be able to break through here without the storms? It's really close, one way or the other. Oh, here come the Zealot reinforcements, and there's some more Storm, and that's the GG. Those were huge storms. They got all of the Vikings. That meant that, because basically when you make that many Vikings, you're looking to clean up the Colossus as fast as possible and then land them to get a lot of additional ground DPS. He didn't have that option because all his Vikings were dead because yeah. all the storms on them. And then, of course, the lack of Metavax. His army was just so, so squishy that... Even yeah. though the Colossus fell pretty quickly, the damage they did in the time they were up was more than enough to weaken it up. And then the gateway units were easily able to overtake and clean it up. Yeah. And he was pretty all in at that point. There was four base Templar, Zealot upgrades, everything. Just your normal late game Protoss army coming at him behind it. And Diastar, I don't know. I, I, he could have given it another try. He did almost trade armies, but I, I think the biggest thing there was really poor ghost usage. He didn't get a single EMP off on the Templar. I'm not sure what he was really doing with those. Yeah, I think a, the last good... EMP did wing one of them. And I think that may have done a little bit there, but not much. I mean, it was a bit of a weird engagement because you'd think the storms would go down the army. They actually went down on the Vikings. Mm -hmm. And then the EMPs didn't go off, but the last one kind of winged a few Templar. And then the reinforcement Templar came in behind that later on in the fight. So it was a little difficult to tell which way it was going. But yeah, Ike to managed an, to make the push there. To an extent, Ike actually forced that to happen. It was kind of nicely done by him. 
what he did was he he blunk his blunk blink, blunk, he, he blunk he blunked his uh, <laughs> his stalkers forward to actually trace down chase down the ghosts and isolate them from the rest of the army and then set up to use his templar as his anti air to try and protect the colossus just spending all his storms and what that did was that zoned out the ghosts prevented them from getting a lot of good EMPs off on the meat of the army yeah and that was really really smart there because without that many medevacs he was pretty okay losing his colossus as long as the rest of his army was still there, because warp gate units do pretty okay against bio as long as there's not a whole lot of medevacs supporting them. I'm not sure how much of that was conscious and how much of it just played out, but it ended up working out really, really well for him. And if it was all planned out, he's he's kind of a genius. It was nicely done, I gotta admit. That was really, really good play. Ike continues to show that, but the question is, can he continue to do that against tougher opponents? Die Star, clearly the... You know, it's not much of an insult to say that he is the weakest among alongside Nurcio and Mana, you know, who yeah. are very good accomplished players. The question is, who do they send out against him? I don't necessarily think they want to throw Nurcio out here. I mean, but then again, Mana's also lost a PvP to Aiki before, so this is actually a PvP before, so this is actually a bit tough for them. PvZ does seem to be his weakness, but... Nurture's lost the ZVP thus far today, and not in particularly impressive fashion. It wasn't yeah. like a close back and forth, no. well, he just outplayed me kind of game. It was a, like, well, what was Nurture doing there? That looked pretty bad kind of thing. And against a player like Aiki, uh, I, I think you're really going to have to outplay him. Even if it did look like his weaker matchup, he does not look like he's going to be a pushover at all. So, I don't know. I think sending out mana may be the better option. I think you really want to keep Nurture in reserve to try and hold off Snoot. Or try, well, try and beat Snoot at the end of it. But Mana already lost to him, too. I don't know. This guy is honestly kind of scary. He seems very good and hard to deal with, so I'm not sure what they should really do about it. Yeah. It's... I've got to say, you know, it's impressive. It's... You, you can complain about Protoss all you damn well please, I suppose, and no doubt people will and say, oh, it's not impressive, he's just playing Protoss. He's playing Protoss very, very well. And he is doing so in a fashion that's very well calculated. And he is taking good fights. He he has solid build orders, and he evidently isn't just a one-trick pony either. He's definitely very Colossus heavy. That we've certainly noticed. That's his favorite unit there. But he doesn't do the same build every time. He's not just a one-trick pony. So so far, considering this guy has taken four maps in this tournament, that's that's pretty good. That's hard to argue with that ratio. It's currently four-one. He's taking them in pretty impressive fashion too. Like he's he's making good decisions. He has good macro. I would say his control has been the one letdown, but even at times that has looked quite quite solid. His decision making, his build orders are all very good. He does not look like a generic, like dumb Protoss who's getting some lucky wins because his race is strong. He looks like uh, quite a solid player who happens to play Protoss. Indeed, and there are some of those, as it turns out. <laughs> yes, yes, there are. All right, will we be taking a break? Uh, it looks uh, like possibly it not. Uh, yeah, they're gonna send Nurture out. All right. That's interesting, and it's on Derelict Watcher. Hmm. hmm. Well, Fred Gao, his manager, actually put out a tweet a little while ago that I believe said, "Dear Nurture, please stop throwing ZVPs." <laughs> we'll see if we can do that. Uh, I would say that. Well, I, I don't think it's really going out on them here to say that Aiki, Aiki, Aiki definitely seems like the much better player than... Who was the Spanish Protoss? Revenge? Majestic. Majestic. Not not Revenge at all. That's revenge not even close. is that a Korean. That's terrible. Yes. Yeah. Um, he, I would say Aiki is definitely the much more impressive player than Majestic thus far, and Majestic did manage to beat Nurcio in pretty comfortable fashion even after an early game disadvantage. Nurcio just looked kind of kind of lost there. He just, he made Roach Hydra Corruptor and then threw it away and that was it. Did not look like a very clean, polished CVP at all. Not exactly. And nothing compared to Slivko. Like, Slivko, maybe not as recognized a player as Nurcio, but his CVP looked very on point. He was very on yeah. top of everything. Uh, the decision to go Broodlord there I thought was a little bit questionable, but he made it work. And it definitely looked like he had a better handle on the matchup than Nurcio did in his CVP. So, the fact that Ike lost him I don't think that's particularly telling for the outcome of this match. I'm, I'm not particularly worried for him that he's going to get outclassed by Nurcio. No. Well, let's see what happens then, because I am intrigued. Will we see Nurcio throw another ZVP, as his manager claims? Also, by the way, Nurcio's response to that is, Dear Fred Gao, why is David Kim not talking to me? Regards your player. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, I like Nurcio. 
Yes, <laughs> we all do. I think this would be a far less entertaining game if Nurcio was not playing it. So, to the southwest position on Devil Egg Watcher. In the blue trunks, playing for Team Norway. From Carnage Esports, it is Aiki. Versus his opponent to the northeast position in the red trunks for Poland. The captain of Team Poland. Although, at this point, not really the captain of ZVP. So we're going to need to see a bit of a turnaround in this matchup for him. In the red trunks playing Zerg, Team Aces Nurcio. Looks like gateway expansion once again. This is the same way he opened, um, inclu including the, the placement of the pylon, the gateway wall in above his ramp. Same way he opened up against Slivko. That game, he played very, very generically. Just gateway expansion into Stargate, into a third base, into Protoss Ball. As pretty much as generic as you can get for ZV, or for PVZ. Uh -huh. And Nurture, of course, on the other hand, opening up with his normal pool first. Nothing, nothing too exciting out of either player just yet. How horribly disappointing. Yeah, Nurture should just six pool. Why not? Well, it would have meant that we uh, got to go to bed quicker. <laughs> that would have been nice. This has actually been a very long series up to this point. We've, we've been doing this for what? It's eight been a hours? pretty long day. We started yeah. at eight. It's now four. So eight yeah, hours. it's eight and a half hours now. Yep. We might have to speed up day two, I think. Or either that, or we could just hope for a lot more three zeros, which we might see. I don't know. Yeah, this has been. We were talking about that. This has been surprisingly close. There's been lots of five game matches. Yeah. In a group of teams that I really didn't think would be that no. well matched. I, I thought it would be much more one sided. Yeah, I thought it would have been Russia through first and then Poland second. That that was my prediction, but it could still be. But it was a lot closer than I would have expected it to be. Obviously, yeah, the, the Spain 3-0 was a bit predictable, but outside of that... The important part is, I, I figured it would be Russia first and Poland second, but everything would be very one-sided, except for yeah. maybe Russia versus Poland. I thought uh -huh. it would be all kind of stomps. Yeah. Not, not at all the case. No, not at all. Uh, and it's worked out pretty well for these guys up to this point, proving there's uh, definitely a talent pool in Europe. Oh, certainly. I don't, I don't think anyone would would question that. There's so many names on the European ladder who anyone international, myself included, would be like, what? And then you see them play a couple of games and you're like, oh, that guy's actually pretty good. Yeah. And then it just happens over and over and over. Yeah, there's a lot of them. It's kind of terrifying. Ling's on the way in and there's actually nothing blocking that ramp. If Nurture had realized that, he could have gone right into the base there. Uh, he, no, he, he would rather kill pylons. pylons. Uh, that seems to be a habit of his. He's, bigger. He's very big on killing pylons. Yes. Forcing cancel pylons. Little shattered crystals of dreams on the ground. Yeah, quick Stargate once again, and still no units at all. Nurcio could actually just run in there and see that yeah. if he wanted to. It's pretty comical, really. He doesn't know, though. Aiki is no. cutting so many corners at that point. That's, that is a hallmark of a good, just a good RTS player in general. Uh, no way every to cut race. corners. Yeah, you just play as risky, as greedy as you possibly can, right up until the point where it would start to cost you. If you know or think you can get away with it, and you can, then it's just an advantage for you. You yeah, absolutely might as well. And he got away with it. He did. He's building a sentry now, just in case, you know, 20 lings come knock, knock, knock on the front door, and you can't kill that with one mothership core. As good as the mothership core might be, it's not that good. And we've got a stargate and the double gateway, so the same kind of style uh, into Phoenix that we saw against Slivko. Immediate Phoenix. If you ask me for a generic good solid pvc build i would say that this is it you get your five phoenix out right away you go into colossus you take a third base and then you macro from there five phoenix just it gives you good harassment potential it gives you good map control good everything um and there's not no, there's nothing it's very weak against it's not going to get you a free win but more often than not it's going to secure you some kind of an advantage and it's definitely not going to give you a disadvantage yeah this is just a very good generic build got that forge coming up so he's not going to be looking for any kind of gateway pressure there's no pylons or probes out on the map or anything. He's just going to be using those Phoenix for harassment and map control, getting his upgrades going and head into a macro game, which seems to be where he's most comfortable. Two more gas taken down the bottom there. A couple of spore crawlers coming up from Nurcio. Like, well, that's a decent way of dealing with Phoenix and also just to make sure there's no Dark Templar shenanigans going on. Roach Warren on the way up for our Zerg player as well. And now I just, I really want to see Nurcio play a late game ZVP and see where he goes with it because the last time we saw it it was kind of disappointing It was really strange mid-game nonsense that didn't really go anywhere Yeah, I was about to say that wasn't that wasn't late game PVZ no, or ZVP not. at all That that was what I do when I don't want to make swarm hosts because it, 
leads to boring games and I don't know it just it doesn't really work like going corruptor and doing any kind of flare timing you have to be really really far ahead or your opponent has to be playing really really greedy for it to actually have any chance to work against a player like this and even a player like Majestic it's just it it's, it's a very big risk to take and something that a player of Nurture Excalibur really does not need to do I mean we saw Targa has some success with it against Titan earlier on, but he got to be very, very greedy early on, and he had a very good composition against what Titan had, and Titan didn't scout and didn't respond. Generally speaking, those mid-game timings, those are a really, really bad um, bad thing to do. Well, Ike picks off three drones and doesn't lose a Phoenix, so nice little bit of harass in the main base there. As it stands, Nurchio sits comfortably on three bases. Hydralisk Den is on the way up, and a Colossus Den has already started here for Elki. El Ike, god damn it! <laughs> and it, it does look like Nurtio kind of wants to do that kind of Roach Hydraling based timing. Uh, a Hydra Den that quick, he's still only on three hatcheries, he does not have any kind of surplus of drones by any means. Uh, and he's making a lot of Zerglings, and he's getting a Spire. Now, the Spire, the Hydra Den, and the fact that he hasn't made any Roaches means that could be like a Hydraling timing into Muta Switch. That's very popular, um, or it was very popular for a while amongst a lot of Zergs, particularly Korean Zergs. I think that was popularized by Dom Rigu. Uh, it's less less so now because Protoss have just gotten better versus it. They figured out Colossus timing to hold off the Hydra Link, and then they just make a bunch of extra Phoenix, and they kind of they, they beat you really easily. Oh, but it looks like some Zergling is actually going in for Harass on the third next. Not complete yet. He definitely could force a cancel on this, uh, and he actually could surround these units. And maybe See how good these force fields are. And in fact, I think, he's, yeah, he's just going to let it go. Never mind. I was going to say, all right, well, let's see if he can force field that off. But apparently not. I think Ike just wants to make Nurtio pay as much as possible for this. And he's not going to be able to make him pay. Pylons, the mortal enemy of Nurtio, being destroyed by the thousands here. And Ike's actually opting to go for it here. That's not a good decision at all. He's going to lose all these units. And he can't afford to lose sentries with units on the way. Uh, Nurtio actually making a really smart decision here, not building any Hydras, realizing that he found an opening with his Zergling, so he has no need to, to, to invest in gas to actually make damage happen. So he's just saving up all that gas for a huge Muta switch in a second here. His Spire has actually Corruptors. That's that's kind of odd. Um, I'm not sure what the killing force is going to be if he goes Corruptors, because he doesn't really have Ling upgrades. He can't just mass Ling and overwhelm him. But he's not producing Hydras either. He does switch into Ling upgrades, but... I oh, know, I guess he's just going to play Containment, use his Corruptors right. to control the air, and use Zerglings to deny a third base. So creating really early Flyer Carapace, actually. Which yeah. is... I mean, that's Flyer okay. Carapace, it helps out uh, a decent amount against the Phoenix. Uh, it's still kind of odd, kind of unusual. But there it, are it only does five help. Phoenixes at this point. Yeah, I guess he's assuming that more will be on the way when he figures out it's an air switch. But he's going to see Corruptors, and so he's not going to want to go Phoenix. But what, whatever Nurtio's thought process is here, he has contained Aiki to two bases for quite some time. Yep. And he has access to air tech, which helps out quite a bit in low econ situation. And he's actually going to pick off the Mothership core with those Corruptors. So Very a little nice. bit sloppy by Aiki, not recalling out quite in time. Yep. Fourth and fifth base is coming up for Nurtio. He still hasn't switched into Munis, though. He's just going uh, one Evo ground upgrades, making some Corruptors. I don't know. I'm not I'm not sure what he's aiming for. Okay, There's there goes Mutas. So he's going to establish Air Damas with the Corruptors and then just switch into Mutas and play a normal Muta-based CVP from there on out. All right, well, and that's pretty smart to do, because yeah. the biggest problem with going Muta is if there's a big Phoenix flock up to just chase you down and never allow you to get map control. So if you go Corruptors first, you really, really discourage that. And he had enough of an advantage that he could get away with that. He didn't need Mutas right away. He didn't need map control right away. Yeah. So nice, smart play from Nurtio there. He's been maintaining it for quite some time as well. Ever since he took the third base out and just said, hey, look, I've got a bunch of lings on the map. You don't want to go anywhere. You better sit in your choke point. And if you don't, then I'm going to go and kill you. He's been able to establish map dominance, take that fourth base. The Phoenix is coming from the side, and they're going to try and pick something off, but they don't really manage to make that happen. Corruptors coming and get the Mothership Core again. Very nice that's, pick off there for Nurtio. And it, they're just going right for the Void Ray. And they might even be able to take a Colossus out here. They do. Whoa. That, yeah. Those are uh, some of the most cost-effective uh, Corruptors I've ever seen. And he lost like one Corruptor for that, yeah. maybe. And he took a Colossus, two Mothership Cores, a Void Ray. And he scared off all the Phoenix. He has Mutas and Lings on the way now. And Ike's moving out with a pretty decent two-base army. But... He's just going to lose all the bosses, and then yeah, he has die. Elite left, so he's going to get overwhelmed by Lings, Hydras, Mutas, whatever he wants to make. 
Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a lost cause at this point. Yeah, it's a lot of zealots, and they're, they're plus two, which helps. He's warping in seven more, but once the meteors get on top of that, unless those phoenixes somehow pick them off, which is not going to happen because there's 21 of them, then... Yeah, that's, I think that's going to be all she wrote for Ike. And in comes the engagement here. And there'll be a lot of dead links, but there'll also be a lot of lead zealots. That's not really, you know, lead zealots sounds like a, a pretty fantastic hard rock band there. But I have a feeling that's going to be the GG. There we go. Oh, dear. Well, that was kind of underwhelming from Ike, but very well played from Nurcio. Um, yeah. I don't know. It mostly came down to Ike's choice to try and defend that third base. When you see that many Zerglings... It's just a lost cause. He, if nothing else, he should have just sat in that corner and threatened force fields. He should not have moved out and tried to fight that. There was no way he was going to win. But yeah, this Nurtio's decision to make that many circlings was a smart one. Uh, Ike really needed to turtle up on two base, wait for a Colossus to move out and try and take that third. If he had done that, he would have been in fine shape, but donating that many units meant he was just contained forever. It, it allowed the choice to go Corruptors first, which turned out to really pay off, and then some sloppy control. I don't know. Not, not, not what we saw in the other matchups from Mikey. His PVZ, PVZ definitely doesn't seem quite as clean. Yeah, that's unfortunate. It seems like his PVT is definitely the strongest matchup. And his PvP was pretty good too. But that is not a matchup that he is doing particularly well in. So that's unfortunate. Hoping for the kind of Cinderella story there with Ike. We didn't quite get it. Nurture was able to reestablish his dominance. One assumes because Fred Gao threatened to cut his salary if he didn't. <laughs> Yeah, whatever it was, it was it was effective. Poland is now up, now up two to one with who's remaining? As uh, Snoot remaining. Okay. Uh, Nurcio versus Snoot. I don't know. Nurcio made short work work of Vortex, and Vortex and Snoot. You would generally say Vortex is probably the higher caliber player, although Vortex did not play like it today, so can't can't quite jump to that conclusion just yet. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It's hard to say, really. I mean, Snoot has played some absolutely phenomenal ZVZ, and in fact has won tournaments off the back of his ZVZ. But we should also bear in mind that that was a little while ago, and those statistics don't necessarily match up to his current level. He has been stating over and over again that he, he doesn't feel like he's really where he wants to be right now. Yeah, not at all. It really showed in the play. It was unfortunate, certainly. I mean, his actual win rate for ZVZ is, funnily enough, his lowest, which, which is why, again, the, the TLPD stats don't really necessarily reflect his skill. His actual highest win rate is against Protoss. In fact, he's won his last six tournament games against Protoss, as it turns out. Oh, wow. Pretty... That's, that's not easy in the current state of ZVP, either. A lot of Zerks, well, except for Pro League, a lot of Zerks have been struggling with the matchup. Yeah, he, he won convincingly against Showtime, took th three game 3-0 three off Lilbo, and then took out Nanaki as well. Oh, well, Although, that's, that's not the highest caliber of competition. No, he did lose to Arthur 2-1 in a quite recent Zotac final, so that's something to bear in mind. He also lost to Daisy in Asa Team Story Cup, so it's, it's perhaps not his best. But, I, I mean, I do really think that historically his ZBZ has been fantastic. It has been, for sure. Yeah. He did. We did actually see him up against Impact twice in Acer Team Story Cup Season 2 Final, and he lost both times. And it was quite convincing losses as well, but we'll see. I mean, that, that can happen in ZBZ, though. We've totally, even seen yeah. today just some very bizarre, like, Nurcio yeah. versus Targa. He would say, Nurcio, I don't win that. Targa, he did a Roche Bane bust. He hit it well. It caught Nurcio off guard, and that was all it took. And we've seen other games along this line, like Nurcio coming out with that early speedling rush against... Vortex. Vortex was relatively quite prepared for it. Like, he, he had an idea something was coming, he was saving up, he wasn't playing too greedy, but he just he, he flat out killed his hatchery and that was the end of the game. So, it's a very easy matchup to lose, even if you're playing against someone who isn't quite as good as you. Indeed. Alright, well, Snoot is the final hope here for Poland against Nurcio. Let's see if Snoot's ZBZ is up to task or whether Nurcio will be able to dispose of him in the same way that he did to Vortex. Polar Knight will be the venue for potentially the last encounter of the evening. It has been a long day. We've obviously had quite a lot of delays and things like that, but the hope is day two, which will start at the same time as yesterday, by the way. Well, same time as yesterday, what? Same time as today, by the way, is something that you might want to be tuning into. We do have four more national teams battling it out, including France, so you'll get to see Le Todd, and it will be wonderful, as it always is. Which other teams are in? I know France and Sweden and Ukraine. So who's the eighth? France, Sweden, Ukraine, and some other team. I whose name escapes me. Germany? I, they don't have a whole lot of yeah, players. Yeah, it is Germany. Uh, oh. so, uh, Zocker is captaining that team, I believe. 
Yeah, it is It is certainly Germany. I wonder if TLO's playing there. I don't think he is. I'm curious who the rest of their lineup would be. I haven't really kept up with who their, their new good players are. Mm -hmm. I could double check after that. We'll do a quick rundown before we end the show. But here we are on Polar Night to the south position in the Red Trunks playing Zerg. It is representing Team Norway, the last man standing, Team Liquid Snoot. And I'm trying to figure out what the hell that clan tag means. TRLDM. Uh, it could be... He was in Korea for a while, so it could be something typed with... Like, you type it with Korean on it and spell something oh, in Korean. Because okay. huh, I think that works. Maybe. It's, it's alternating consonants and... Uh, the other Vowels. one. <laughs> yeah. I've been casting for way too long. I, Apparently, yeah. I, I only got like five hours of sleep in my defense. I am oh. not a stupid American. I would like to at least believe that for a while. That was terrible. Let's, let's forget about that. Let's talk Confidence about the in the other um, one. Nurchio's going it. 15 pool here. He is. <laughs> first. Moving swiftly along. <laughs> oh, man. Yep, so pool first versus hatch first, but... No unusual timings from either, so it doesn't really make that much of a difference. No, it's a situation Nurture is absolutely comfortable with. He opens up pool first pretty much every game. He has opened up pool first every single CVC thus far today. Uh, so he is more than used to playing against Hatchery first. And he's opening up with another gas, but not quite as early as he did in the game versus Vortex. So it's not looking like he's going for that same uh, circling rush that he did to great effect there. <laughs> It's smart. That's that's the kind of build that is very easily counterable if you know for sure that it's coming, or even if you really, really suspect that that specific build is coming. So, Nurcio keeping keeping his opponents on his toes, not letting himself get too predictable. Good. Yeah, the first few minutes looking fairly passive for the most part. I have yeah, to wonder, who decides to get aggressive first here? Nurcio, Nurcio likes being aggressive. He likes making things happen. Uh, and taking control of the game. He just yep. likes to like have control of the tempo of the game. Uh -huh. I think it's very important to him. Um, but in ZBZ, it's kind of hard to be too aggressive without really committing a lot of resources sometimes. Um, early Ling Baneling attacks are just about the only way. We haven't seen him do too much of that. Uh, because with his build, it's kind of uncomfortable to get a lot of early Lings and Banelings out. You can either commit to a Ling all-in, yeah. or you kind of have to sit back and play a little bit more passively. So I'm not sure if we're going to see that. And we actually see a very quick spine crawler coming out from Snoot. So he is a little bit worried about the potential for that speedling all in, I think. Because that's a very early spine crawler, uh, even before his baneling nest. Yeah. And you don't really see that unless there's a reason for it. Oh, well, he's putting down his own baneling nest. We're not seeing anything out of Nurtio as of yet. Is he still in gas? Yep, there we go. There's his baneling nest coming down here. So we'll be seeing that momentarily. With the spine crawler down, Snoot naturally would want to try and be the defender there. Snoot's definitely looking to play, uh, if not defensively, I think he's just kind of scared. Uh, he saw the build that Nurtio did the previous match against Vortex, yeah. and he's just kind of worried about something similar happening to him. Right. So he's playing very, very defensively, almost unnecessarily so. Uh, mm. It's kind of costing him in terms of the drone count. Uh, sorry, is the, is the game lagging a lot? Is that, is that me? Mm, I think that's you. I'm not seeing any lag here. Okay, that's weird. Um, apologies have anything open. I, I mean, it doesn't bother me. I'm just worried that I'm messing it up for some other. It some doesn't look like it. Players. It's looking absolutely smooth over here, so these guys aren't complaining. Well, okay. Nochio is the first to surge the links out. A, a single Bane Ling comes out from Snoot. He might need a few more. I don't think that's going to work out too well for him. And as you said, Nochio is going to be the aggressor. We'll see if that spine crawler actually pays off for him. It's good that he already has it there. It will help a little. But of course, we are talking about Zerglings here, not a bunch of roaches. The links will be able to run past it. I wonder, there's, what do you think of the positioning of that spine crawler? Uh, it's very, very out, very exposed, and there's only a single bane link. So if Nurtrio is able to dodge that, he can out, but he's not. Yeah, it, he's yep. thinking about it. Yeah, it's pieces nah, of link flying circlings everywhere. Now. There's too many circlings now. He can't go in there. Yeah. And interestingly enough, they're actually both going for quick carapace builds. Uh, both going down Evo Chamber and headed up towards Mass Links, presumably. Although Nurtrio, oh no, nope, Nurtrio starting plus one, so he will be headed for roaches. Yep. Whereas it looks like Snoot is going for the plus one carapace, the mass lings, probably into mutas, into whatever he feels like at the time, but definitely prolongs Earthling aggression from him. And that's really, really good for Nurtrio. This is uh, definitely a build order, not a build order win, but a build order advantage for him. The yep. Earthlings aren't going to be able to do anything at all, and if he hits a good roach timing, he's going to be very, very powerful. The Snoot. thing is, 
Snoot will have a bit of map control with the added mobility from the circling, so he can't take that quicker third base, and then it's going to be on Nurtio to punish that. Well, Snoot got his third cancel there. Uh, it was a nice little pickup. The map awareness has been very, very good so far from Nurtio. He has good vision. He's got overloads in good places, and he's looking for yet another cancellation. He's going to get it and kill the drone for a second time. So that works out really well for him. A couple of uh, lings are going to die as well. Baneling detonation goes off. Not too- Oh! Wow! I was about to say not too effective, and then that happens. That Good lord. That effective. Massive. Oh, we have 10 on actually, 10 roaches. I didn't, I didn't notice, but Nurtio hasn't actually started a lair. He's going for just, like, a roach attack here. So this is going to be a bunch of slow plus one roaches. And it looks like Snoot's actually getting aggressive, so he might waste some units here. And if he wastes any units at all, that's going to be make it very, very hard for him to defend. The thing is... Nurtio really has to worry about counterattacks here because he has no mobility whatsoever in, to deal with counterattacks. Yep, and there's the cancellations from Snoot. He sees what's going in. He thankfully he scouted first. If he went in there with Banelings and met with 14 Roaches, that that would have been an absolute disaster. But he's able to cancel out of that, loses bare minimum, and now he's going to try and play catch the Roach, and he's going to need a large army to do that. He's going to be able to exploit the immobility of it. There's a couple of Roaches walling off here. Nurtio is able to prevent some of those links from coming in, but others get into the mineral line here, and the rest of the links now making their way around to try and cancel that third base, which with that many Roaches, actually it might happen if he's able to get a good surround. He's not able to get it, though. Working on it, he's working on it. I think, yeah, he might be able to get the kill. He gets the kill, and the Banelings go off. They don't really do much, but he is able to force the cancel there. And this entire time, there's still been Zerglings in the main, picking away at the drone line. Uh, he's lost... He's managed to kill 10 workers thus yeah. far, which is quite a bit, because Nurtio didn't have that many workers to begin with. He wasn't going super high economy. And Nurtio realizing that he's kind of going to have to just go all in here. He has a lot of Roaches left. A lot of Zerglings have been lost on Snoot's side. And Snoot does not have any more spine crawlers, but he does have Roaches in production. And defensive Roaches beat offensive Roaches very, very yeah. hard. So this is this is going to be tough for Nurtio to make what he needs happen. A Roach is cancelled out there for Snoot. A bit of a, a waste of lava there, unfortunately, but never mind. And... Now Nurtio trying to get the good concave, he's able to do so. Snoot getting caught a little bit out of position. Looks like he's going to lose a queen and a roach at the back there. There aren't really many spine crawlers. But as you said, the defender's advantage when it comes to roaches is very important. Banelings kind of stuck behind the roaches there, but it's currently 17 to 14. Nurtio pushing out yet more of them. He's going to need a lot more to make this happen. Another small ling run by will most likely be deflected by that spine crawler. These roaches looking to take out the third, and they should be able to successfully do just that. We have Roach Speed on the way already for Snoop, and he does have the plus one carapace, uh, as opposed to the plus one range attack of Nurtio. Plus one attack, I think it's a slight, slight advantage, but it's not that big of a deal. Luckily for Snoop, he didn't go for plus one melee weapons or anything like that that wouldn't transfer. Yeah. So he just has, he has an upgrade advantage, he has a bit of a drone advantage, and he has, I believe, a pretty significant... Actually, they're dead even in Roaches. Yeah. But Snoot has restarted his third base a little bit before Nurtio. Overall, they've ended up pretty equal. I would say a slight, slight lead to Snoot, but it's actually very, very equal. Much more equal than I expected. Mm. Well, the third base is now on its way up here for Nurtio, and of course is building rebuilding for the fourth time, I think. There was two cancellations and then a kill. And uh, Nurtio now looking to posture in that general direction. He can't do it. There are too many roaches. It doesn't seem like it would make a lot of sense to attack at this point. He is waiting for speed to kick in, but Snoots is going to finish before his. Upgrades are plenty are coming for Nurtio here, though. He's looking on plus two there, and he's working on his plus one ground carapace. Yeah, uh, it's going to turn into an upgrade advantage for Nurtio. However, uh, Snoot has actually been producing pretty much pure Roaches, and he's continuing to do so. And he's jumped out to a 41 to 26 Roach lead. I'm not sure what Nurtio has been doing, but he has not been making Roaches. And that might just cost him the game right here. Uh, 45 to 26, pretty significant. A lot of dudes. A lot of dudes, yeah. And Snoot is just marching forward with a huge collection of roaches. And that base is forfeit. That will die in three or four salvos. Down it goes. And the Nurtio is actually attempting to counterattack while his opponent's army is out of position. And take down that third base. He might be able to kill it before the roaches get back there. I, I think he will, actually. I think he's going to be able to snipe the hatchery. The question is whether or not Snoot can... Oh, he needs to just focus on the hatchery and get out. He does, he yeah. Fight here. This is not going to work. This is not going to work uh, at all for Nurtio. He's too much time. He's working Nurtio on it. could have gotten the hatchery and got out. Oh, this is going to be brutal. Look at that. And Snoot is able to get right on top of those roaches and deal massive damage. It is 40 to 26 and falling rapidly in favor of Snoot. He defends his third. He kills his opponent's third. He kills off a bunch of roaches. This is looking absolutely fantastic here for the Polish player, the Swedish player. 
Not Swedish. Norway. God damn it. <laughs> I should never cast Nation Wars again. This is this is just awful. My geography is beyond too, all. Ugh. Too many opportunities to offend people. I, I tend to agree. That's what makes it fun. Yeah. The South African player is doing really well here. We're going to stick with that for the time <laughs> being. Uh, and the South African player has jumped to a 40 supply lead. So it's, it's incredible. It's looking, looking pretty much over. Nurcio congratulates him and yep. leaves the game. Nurcio. Native Japanese. It's been taken out there quite nicely by Snoot. Which leaves us with the final game, which is going to be a pretty good one by the looks of it. Snoot versus Mana. It's a classic. It's a good one. If it had to end in any way, it should end that way. Another five game series once again. I think that's Indeed. been four of the five has gone five games yeah. actually today. Yeah. That's, that's pretty, as we said before, it's pretty surprising, pretty absurd. Yeah. And. It's Snoop well, versus so long. <laughs> yes, Snoop versus Mana is going to be interesting. I'm not sure who to give the edge to there. I haven't seen Mana's PVZ. He hasn't played one yet today. I don't believe. Uh, actually, I don't think Snoot has played a ZVP either. So it's kind of both of them are a little bit untested, at least in the Nation War thus far. That is true. All right, Mana and Snoot. Final players available here. So. If they say we need a few minutes to choose our next player, then I'm going to call them filthy liars. <laughs> Lobby is already up, so we're going to jump right into that. Hope you've enjoyed the last two hours commercial free. We did play you a lot of commercials before that, and we will absolutely play you a lot of commercials afterwards. So don't worry. If you've been <laughs> missing the detergent advertisements, then we'll bring them to you. Do not worry. You will know which one to buy. But it is going to be Snooter versus one and only Mana. Should be a good one. It's not Mana's strongest matchup. It's statistically it's Snooters, but I don't believe that for a second. Yeah, you have to be very, very careful with statistics when judging that kind of thing. Indeed. Mana, back in Wings, back when he was really, really good, like possibly, arguably, one of the best foreigners, maybe the second best behind Stefano, mm -hmm. his PVZ was good, but very one-dimensional. He was basically the parting of non-Korean PVZ. He, mm -hmm. he immortal all in, and he did it really, really well. And he didn't do anything else because he didn't need to do anything else. And that that kind of thing doesn't really work so much anymore. Immortal All In is still a very good build to mix in. It's definitely good to use in certain circumstances. If you get any kind of an advantage, it can definitely be a good way to close that out. But it can't be just your absolute go-to, uh, not worry about anything else kind of build anymore. Uh, players have just gotten too good against it. And it's mainly just that. Hydras have gotten a bit better. You can do a lot more two-base kind of builds, that kind of thing. It's just not quite what it used to be. Yeah. Well, players asking for two-minute break, so commercials! We'll be right back. Just being honest. Come on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the final map. We've almost had as many maps as one could possibly have in five best of fives. Too short. Yeah, obviously. We started out with a 3-0, and then everything since has been five games. It has. It has. Very well balanced, one might say. I also discovered what TRLDM yeah, try again. T R L D M means. What does it mean? It means trolldom, which is apparently uh, a three-man Norwegian clan that was formed a week ago and means nothing whatsoever. Good I to see. know. Well, we shall see if Mana is the troll hunter in this <laughs> particular matchup. We will find out. Here it is. Habitation Station is going to be the decider, and a Zerg is playing on it. So, let's see if Mana can deal with it. He's representing Team Poland, and he's to the northwest of Habitation Station in the red. Versus his opponent, for the final time tonight, in the northeast position, representing Norway and Trolldom everywhere. In the blue trunks playing Zerg, he is Liquid Snoot. And it was Mana's map choice, so I wonder, I wonder if they only have five maps for it and he was forced into this, or if he actually wanted to play on this over something else. Mm, possibly. I'm pretty sure they did their vetoes before the series started, so mm. it's possible that they just vetoed something else and then it's like, well, this is the last one, so... I'm honestly not sure. I mean, of course, Zerg bias as always, but I'm honestly not sure it's really that bad for Protoss. You have to keep in mind that the Roachling pressure is a possibility and that it can be very strong. But other than that, I don't really feel like it's that terrible. And I genuinely believe that the gold base is a much bigger uh, advantage for Protoss in the late game than it is for the Zerg. Because mm -hmm. Zealot Orphans can just be so powerful. You can afford so many of them. Yeah, I think you might be right with that. I, I don't honestly think that the map has been explored enough. And I also really dislike this. 
I suppose there's this culture that's been around in StarCraft 2 for a while uh, in the sense that if a map is non-standard in any way and you have even the slightest inkling it might be imbalanced before you even find out, you just hit that uh, veto button immediately and then just say, take it out of the map pool, which to me, I don't know. As a pro player and someone who ladders a lot more, I think you'd have a, a much better opinion on this than me, but it does seem a little excessive to look at a map and just immediately veto it on the basis that it might be imbalanced before you actually know that that's the case. Yeah, almost everything is worth a play, at least a couple of times, to give it a give it a try. Except for Talter Zim Alter, the big blue one. Oh, that thing. That map has no place in anything ever, then just needs to be burned. Apparently Desro believes it's a good map. Well, that's that's the kiss of death right there. I <laughs> should tell you. That's an awful map. Daedalus Point, however, is a fantastic map. It should be played in every series <laughs> ever, multiple times if possible. Funnily enough, Desro would actually agree with you on that as well. I played him on it. It didn't seem like he, he he thought that so much. Well, he won his... He didn't seem to like it then. He won his WCS match on it, which like nobody really expected. He actually came up with a, a really nice build that seemed to work there. Huh. Quite That's interesting. I can't imagine what it would be. I think it just involved an awful lot of force fields, if I recall correctly. That's, that's usually a pretty good answer to pretty much anything. <laughs> Snoot's making his way across the map, and with six Zerglings as an opening there. Do you, do you, it's kind of, what do you reckon to that? Kind of unusual. Yeah. Um, it's going to work out pretty well here, because we don't have don't have a Mothership for yet. Oh, no. The Mothership no, for is out. I thought he was being greedy. So, yeah, those are just going to get chased away. Maybe they force a cancel. I don't think so, though. Let's see how good his Micro is. That's almost League of Legends level of Micro right there, but he's getting out. There we go. Not quite. Not quite. Not, not quite there yet. Uh, if we had Faker here, that Nexus would be cancelled for sure. Indeed. It would be dead. The entire team would be dead. Dragon would be dead. It would be incredible. It's like, how did he do it? We just don't know. He's just that talented. He microed. Wow. He pressed the micro button. Yes. They have at least three buttons that they can press in League four of Legends. Four micro buttons. Four. They have four. Four buttons. Scary. Well, I mean, that's better than StarCraft 2, where each of these units only has a maximum of three buttons. What? what? Three, three spells. Buttons? Oh, I didn't know that was actual a cap. I never thought about that. In Starbow, there's at least four on Yes, side. there are. The, the Queen's got a lot of buttons, hasn't she? So that's what... She has four buttons. Yeah, I'm four not buttons. I'm sure if all of them are any good or not. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't quite figured really it out yet. The doesn't seem to do that much. Oh, the Lava Inject? Yeah. Yeah, but apparently her Nurturing Swarm or whatever is really, really OP. I'd never tried it. I hadn't used it yet. Yeah. But people are complaining about it. Apparently, it's super strong. It accelerates building times. Quite significantly. Oh, really? I thought it yeah. just healed shit. Oh, no. I didn't, I didn't it, realize it, it accelerated. Oh, yeah, it ex it wow. says accelerates morph times, which in theory could it's also a work. Faster. Yeah, it'll, it'll make the buildings more faster, but in theory that could also work on units that morph, which would be kind of neat. Huh. Spam out lurkers. Something like that. Yeah. Get the fastest morphing bailings of all time. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think Zerg is going to have a super, super high skill cap at that. I'm actually kind of excited for it. It mm. just seems like there's so much you can do to make yourself better. Yeah. I'm interested to know what they do with smart casting with that mod and whether or not they're going to just turn it off. I kind of think they should remove it, but I don't think it's make or break either way. Mm. I'm not sure. One way or the other, they actually released patch notes for that thing today. They nerfed roaches, yeah, so. strangely enough, which is funny considering I've only actually ever seen them used once, but apparently the, the burrow was actually a little bit too ridiculous when used properly. Apparently it took half damage and moved faster than the above ground speed while yes, burrowed. Yes, it does. It sounds uh, kind of absurd. Yeah, you only get to use it for about six seconds, though. It's a timed ability. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, I didn't experiment with that yet, either. Yeah. I was too, too busy having fun with having defilers back. <laughs> yeah, those are a lot of fun to watch. Really, really good. Anyway, let's get back to the real game, shall we? Instead of that silly mod that nobody likes. And I'm lying. I love that mod. Anyway, the War Prism is on the way here for Mana. And the Roach Warrant for Snooter. Not much happened in the last few minutes. But Mana is rolling out with a fairly small force. But we are talking about Mana with force field. So he'll be fine <laughs> regardless. Well, I mean, he has a Mothership Core. Of course, he's going to be fine regardless. Yes. But he, he is actually dropping, or he has a probe with him. He can drop a pile on if he wants. Mm -hmm. But he only has three gateways. So this is not going to turn into a game-winning attack one way or the other. And oh, Mothership wow. Core isn't with, he can't recall out. And the Link's got in there. He's going to lose all of his sentries. Well, that is an absolute disaster. That, Let, that can, was absolutely horrendous. Can I retract what I just said? Is that allowed? Or am I stuck with it forever? <laughs> That was about as bad as that could possibly go. He lost three sentries plus whatever else, and the three sentries is all that really matters. And the war prism's in the main, but Snoot's well aware of it, not going to allow it to do any damage whatsoever. 
And I don't know what mana does here. Losing three sentries early on can be game ending in its own right. You actually put a double stargate. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I can get on board with that. Man, that was just that was just brutal. I did not expect that out of Mana. Mana's force field control is usually extremely good. He is a very cold the, calculated player. I don't know if he could have really salvaged that with force field. Like he could have made himself not die for a while if he had done it better. Like he definitely messed recalled. it up. But he really just needed to recall out. Like the yeah. biggest blunder there was not having a mothership core right over his units as he moved out with three sentries. Yeah, that's no, that's no real excuse for that. Yep. He's making immortals too. What is this going to be? Is this going to be a mortal void ray? Is he just going to be like, if you make roaches, you die? I think so. Uh, and there are roaches on the way, including roach upgrades. So I guess that'll work. And right yeah, now, I guess he immortal void ray. Yeah, that's disgusting. <laughs> it's like, well, let's just take the most evil units in the game that we can and put them in one ball, and then we'll be unstoppable, right? Yeah, that's that's pretty much how it works. Yeah, he, it, he just he's not gonna have any money though. I don't know how much of this he's gonna be able to afford. But Snoot is actually playing super low econ. He's like barely making any drones. He's making a ton of Rochling, which is the worst possible thing he can be doing against two star void ray plus a bunch of immortals and stuff. I think I think Mana might actually win this. Just what Snoot is doing is so absurdly bad against void rays and immortals. Yeah, he's actually just going low econ, three gas Rochling. Which is, I don't know uh, why he would do this blindly. He's doing it without scouting at all. It's actually the worst thing he could be doing right now. Not really sure. I don't have an explanation for that. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. You'd think that he would at least try and scout. He doesn't have a... He, do, he has a couple of overlords, but they, they don't have speed yet. So they're probably not going to be able to scout anything unless we... We may actually see Mana just actually hide behind his buildings, possibly, because he's a little bit worried. So maybe the Overlords do get in if he decides to go for that. But yeah, this is right now, anyway. This is Zealot's oh. Immortal Sentry and a couple of Void Rays, three of them, in fact. That's that's brutal. Mana is actually moving out. This could be a little bit dangerous, because what Snoot's doing is basically an all-in. He just has an absurd amount of units. And as efficient as Immortals and Void Rays are against those units, they can only do so much, yeah. so he has to be really careful not to get caught. He has to be watching his force fields, and mm. he has to hit them perfectly. Because if he gets surrounded, his entire army is bad race. Oh, there's the force fields, That's and they're, they're absolutely fine. The Void Ray is now moving in. Mana kept them secret this entire time, so... He's now gonna move in and attack, but that's a lot of roaches knocking on the front door, and... That's not enough Void Rays, and he's actually... He's gonna have to recall out to his natural here, because he's force fielded himself out here, but... Void Rays are pretty good! So, a lot of roaches end up dying here. Links come in as well, and the recalls come in too. So, Snoot will be able to prevent a third base from going down, absolutely. He's still dealing with this warp prism, which actually hasn't really done anything whatsoever. It's trying to warp in, and it is not going to die. Very nice control there by Mana. And uh, now the Zealots are actually going to do something for once. And he might actually get a queen kill out of this. He's definitely going to get at least a drone or two. Not really accomplishing much. Yeah, Snoot's control is too good. He was able to micro that queen very nicely, and that's the full surround there. No problem at all. I'm still liking Mana's position here. For as absurdly bad as that first attack was, his composition and what Snoot is doing, he has four Void Rays, Colossus, and two Immortals against a yeah. pure Roachling army with no fallback. Snoot was very, very low economy. He's just now taking his fifth and six gases. He only has three hatcheries. Very low production. Very, very low tech. No real upgrades to speak. No upgrades to speak of. I just don't understand at all why Snoop decided to play like this. And Mana's getting a little bit over aggressive here. His mothership port is not with him. If he gets caught, he's gonna die. And oh, game of Thrones continues. Well, yeah, let's see how this one goes. There are a lot of units stuck outside of those force fields. The force fields are generally good, but the sentries are rapidly dying, and this army is gonna get absolutely crushed. Mana's army gets destroyed utterly. And Snoot doesn't really lose a huge amount for it either, so suddenly this swings right back in the favor. And a single Void Ray is not enough to kill 27 Roaches, at least not yet. There's another Colossus available and actually two more Void Rays, however, so it may be that Snoot decides to donate some extra units. Uh, that was just... Uh, that was so bad. If Mana just sits in Turtles, I really think he wins the game. And he had decent scouting information. He knew that Snoot had no follow-up tech, had no real economy to speak of didn't really have anything to go on. And then he just attacks into a massive amount of roaches and links anyway. 
Well, Snoot is and losing a lot of units in this attack, but they're not exactly high value. And he is able to force cancel on the third base there. Snoot obviously kind of obsessed with the idea that he does not want to allow the Protoss player to take a third, which is fine. And it is limiting the Void Ray production significantly. We are talking about Colossus Void Ray, which on four gas, you're not going to be able to make a huge amount of them. No, that is pretty limited by your income. Uh, but yeah, if Mana had just secured that third base, I think he wins for sure. Yeah. I don't want to keep harping on that, but it's just so mind-boggling that he would choose to attack there when he has seen that all his opponent is doing is producing low-tech units. It's really not, it's like, it's not a mana style either. Mana is legendarily passive, and it's mm -hmm. very surprising that he would do a two-base attack like that. It's not like him at all, so unless he has changed his style very recently, and I don't know about it, and I must have cast mana 50-plus games at least, and every single time... He plays passive, passive, passive. He wants three bases. He gets the composition he wants. He molds that composition to what his opponent is doing. And then he attacks when he feels comfortable. He plays defensively. And he's not doing that here. And that's really odd. And it's given Snoot a nice edge who's just got up to Hive. Is working on what looks to be Roach Hydra Viper here. Roach Hydra Viper, going to be very good against this composition as long as he can get the Hydras up and running. There's still a good number of Void Rays there, but it's just such a small army. You see a 60 supply lead for Snoot, and it's not like he has a lot of drones filling that up. He's on relatively low drone income. And lots of Queen's static defense. He's not going to die here. And Snoot still does have Colossus Void Ray. That's a very powerful composition. In, he has a surprising amount of units for the fact that he's been on two base the entire time and he's thrown away. A big high-tech army. Yeah. He has more than I expect. And if he gets that gold base running, it's three base versus three base with a fresh gold base. Snoot does not have a gold. Snoot's still only on really, yeah, still only on three hatcheries, still bad upgrades. The game is actually not lost for mana, as bad yeah. as some of this has been for him. And as absurd as that idea is, he actually could still very easily win this. If this Roche Hydra Viper attack doesn't do massive amounts of work, uh, it's actually going to get kind of scary for uh, Snoot here in a second. But he's going to be pretty hard-pressed to defend this if there's good abducts. Yeah, that's true. And he should be able to do that. There are, of course, no Templar to feed back there. You can focus them down with the Void Rays, but by that point, the abduct has already happened. The range on that is far higher. So it's a bit dangerous for Mana to even be anywhere on the map at all at this point. And it's like he just has to sit and defend this third and make sure he takes a good fight, and then he can start to attack. Because the Hydra count is actually very low. It's only at 13, because he was maxed out. He sacked a few lings here and there. He turned some drones into spines, just so he could get a couple extra units. But it's entirely possible that Mana could hold this. He's actually reached 180 supply, and it's a pretty high-tech 180 supply army. There's only two Colossus. He's hallucinating some, which is really, really smart. If he abducts the hallucinations and doesn't get even one, if even one of the real ones survives. He abducts a hallucination. That's really, really nice. The Obsidian didn't quite come in in time, and the Hydra's also by the looks of it, focusing on a hallucination. The fight comes in. The force fields are fantastic. Look at the number of roaches stuck behind those force fields on the left flank right there. The overcharged void ray smash their way in. Snoop plummets in supply. Mana with the excellent hold. Excellent hold and void rays now doing what void rays do. As you said, only 13 hydras in that. Even 13 hydras for set number of void rays just heads up. I don't know if oh they man. beat that. Those hydras don't even have and speed. They're getting picked off at the back. No, and now, I think for the first time in this game, Mana has actually taken a small supply lead. Snoot's now trying to take his gold base, but that's going to be so exposed once this army gets going. And we now have Templar Tech in the mix as well for Mana. Mana has taken pretty firm control of this game. Roach Hydra Viper is a very timing-oriented build. Yeah, it does not scale well at all. Your first timing attack needs to do really, really big damage. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be in a lot of trouble, because Vipers just take so much supply up out of your army. And they really don't do a whole lot unless you have a very specific setup and composition yeah. to work with them. You really need static defense, you need swarm hosts, so you can abduct units into that and kill them for free. And he's moving towards that now, but it takes a long time to set up well. That it does, and he might not have that time. Mana seems to have found himself an opportunity, and he would be correct in that assumption. There's some spore crawlers going down, but uh, that's nothing that the Colossus can't take out. He just needs to be a little bit careful about how he engages, make sure those don't get caught out of position. There's still a decent number of roaches on the field, a few swarm hosts on the way, but not that kind of big critical mass that you need, and Enduring Locust is not quite done yet either, and Mana wants to fight now. Looking for that to happen. Feedbacks come down the Vipers. Absolutely fantastic feedbacks on the Vipers. Every last one of them gets nailed to the ground there. That's going to be a lot of free roaches that he's able to grab. And the full firepower comes in 
from that Protoss army, and the Zerg gets absolutely decimated. Snoot's sitting on a lot of queens, 14 of them in fact, which will give him a bit of resistance to this Void Ray ball here, but that again was a good fight for Mana. Perfect uh, feedbacks on those Vipers. Not a sim single Abduct went off, which is really important when you only have two Colossus. That's a big chunk of your firepower. Yeah. And if you lose all your Colossus, you lose most of your AoE. And against Swarm Hosts, uh, you, just, you, can't, you have to have AoE. You have to be able to get the Locust, otherwise you're not going to make any progress at all. And Mana just keeps getting stronger. He has this big high-tech army. He's finally starting to scale well upgrades. Uh, he didn't get his Twilight Council for a really long time, so he's stuck at 1-1. Snoot, I believe, is still on 1 1. He has just plus two weapons about to finish. And there's actually a warping in the main, not really going to do too much damage, and a big counterattack. Everything's happening at once. Snoot going in, canceling the fourth base, but at the same time, Mana's going to go in for a frontal assault. He gets denied pretty easily. Yeah, there's a lot of spores there, and this is. I, I hate it when this happens. We are looking at. The Swarm Host Spore Crawler Queen composition, also known as the Fire Cake composition, which can result in very, very long games indeed. So the hope is that that doesn't end up happening, but it's a strong build to go for in this kind of situation. You want to be able to resist these kind of attacks, and Snoot is trying to go for the natural, doesn't really do too much damage, loses a lot of roaches again in the process, evening up the supply, but the Swarm Host count is already at 18. We could be in here for the long haul. Yep. And it's hard to fault him for it. I would say that this is far none the best way to play late game CVP. There's just no other way to really stand up against a Protoss Deathball. You need static defense, you need swarm hosts, and you need vipers to make him, like, just to pull units into your unstoppable wall of stuff. And with that many queens, he's going to be able to keep this alive forever. It's really, really hard for mana to actually attack at this point. He needed to make something happen right after that failed Roach Hydra Viper attack, but he wasn't aware that the Swarm Host switch was coming, so it's kind of understandable that he messed that up. I wonder if he'll be able to make things work with these warp ins because he's already taken out one base. If he can take down the economy of his opponent and just start to warp in behind that big line of Swarm Hosts, maybe he will be able to make this work and he won't have to be forced into a direct confrontation, but we'll see. The uh, Locust coming out, you don't want to be anywhere near that. They're already 2-1, a lovely abduct on the Mothership Core there. Fantastic, that's no recall, which means Mana is not feeling so comfortable out here anymore. No, he's not, and he has no time stops if somehow a fight does happen, or if he really feels the need to clear some locusts. Mana is expanding around his side of the map, it's a smart thing to do. That's the way you really beat this style, you just out-expand it and you counter-attack and you crash everywhere. He needs to have multiple war prisms going, one bottom right, one up in the main. Because there's no mobility at all in Snoot's army. He would he was not setting up for this all game. He does not have the massive amount of static defense that like a Stefano would have in his main, because he he plans for this style. He prepares yes. for it the entire game. He sets up all of his bases to be resistant to counterattacks. Snoot is falling into it out of necessity. So he doesn't have that backup defense against all of the counterattacks. But unfortunately, Mana is not really taking advantage of that. He's just trying to fight a head-on fight, which is where Snoot is really, really good with his composition. Yeah. Storms are coming down here, and Obduct goes on with a Void Ray, and every one of those Void Rays that goes down is absolutely crucial. That's a lot of gas. It's basically a capital unit that gets killed there. The Colossus will be able to do a decent job here, and feedbacks go down, but they go down on Queens. They do not go down on Vipers, and this is a very, very difficult army to attack when Vipers are still alive. If the Vipers go down, then the Colossus can do work, but right now, Creeper's spreading all the way up to the third here. Snoot is putting down seven tumors at a time. Warpins are happening for Mana. He's doing runbys. He has killed one base, and he has completely sacked another, so things are going okay for him here, but... He lost a lot of probes. He's on 49 and he's sitting on 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 bases. That's not quite enough. No. And Snoot, he has free units. He doesn't really need money nearly as much no. as Mana does. Mana is the one who kind of has to make something happen at this point. Can, Snoot can just sit here with Swarmhost in the middle of the map, choke him out, and continue to pound on bases, and eventually something will break. This is a very good map for the Swarmhost Turtle kind of style. It's so easy to cut down the Ooh, Here we go. Here comes the blink. Great transfuse there by Snoot. Absolutely fantastic. Goes for yet another blink into the middle of that. Of course, he doesn't want to go too far because there's plenty of spore crawlers and queens. Obducts come on on two more of the Void Rays. They're charged as best as they can, but they will die. So this Void Ray ball is now down to five, which is a little bit less threatening. The infuriating locusts are still moving their way through here and smashing this army, doing a lot of damage. The DPS is absolutely massive, so you don't want to be anywhere near that. Snoot has now actually taken control of the area by the gold base for mana. 
Uh, I'd be sending swarm hosts up into there and into the natural. So getting more and more annoying, more and more aggressive with these. And at this point, it's starting to just look like a slow, slow, inevitable death for mana. He just doesn't really seem to have an answer for this. He doesn't have the amount of money necessary. He is taking out the bottom right base, and he probably will end up killing that hatchery, but he just doesn't have the money necessary to really force a base race with the warp ins, which is kind of what you have to do if you don't have much economy. Yep. And, uh, and he is going to get, got to get that base. There we go. Okay, so that did pop, which is great. And, but as you said, these are free units. What does he care? He's got, he's relying on locusts, the 35 of them. You can kill as many queens as you want. There's still 35 swarm hosts making locusts. Yep, and Mana actually just given up on defending. He is running around. He is going to go for the base race with his existing army. That's not a bad choice to make at this point. I don't think he's not going to win the wear of attrition. It's just he's, it's getting no. worse and worse for him over time. Yep. And Storms go in. Really time stop. Right on top of it. And he can kill most of the Locusts without taking too much damage, but he hasn't got his hands on the Swarm Hosts yet. That Zealot Warpin is doing damage at the Natural here. Mana looking to try and get... That's a nice choke point for Mana to be in with those Colossus, especially if he can funnel the Locusts. He puts down the Force Field to allow that to actually happen. And he's just eating through those Locusts, and he hasn't really lost too much. He still has a ton of mana left for uh, Storm as well. Yeah. He might be able to make some work. He has a bunch of Zealots in the Natural taking out the Hatchery there. They can go into the main very easily. There's no more defense there. Mana might be able to make something work, and in all of this, Snoot has actually forgotten about his own aggression. He has not taken out the bottom left base, which is completely undefended, and he hasn't even taken out the third slash fourth base of Mana uh, either. Although he does have some Locusts rallied over there, that should happen eventually. But with Mana's army coming back to defend, he might be able to hold on to that. And this so hive is getting pretty low, man. It's my... Uh, I don't... It shouldn't die. Actually, it's coming pretty close. Plus three Zealots are quite good. And uh, it's, 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 oh wow, he play, wow. picks off the hive, that is fantastic. Mana is really bringing this back, I mean, oh, the army supplies don't really tell that kind of story, but, oh, he gets on top of the swarm host yet again, he's able to kill off a couple of them, which is nice, that means there's only 36 more he has to deal with, but a storm right on top of the swarm host, and on top of the locusts as well. Colossus, a good firing angle, I'm liking this right here for Mana, he takes out yet more, he's forced back, however, needs to keep those spellcasters alive. He absolutely does. Every It's just so hard for him to replace. Actually, he's gaining more and more bank, more and more money. He has mining bases, and Snoot really doesn't. He only has that gold base going, and it's not even completely saturated. And he's actually going to take out another hatch with these Zealot Warpins. There's just no mobile response at all from Snoot. He has no static defense to fall back on. Swarm Host obviously can't respond to it well enough. And another hatchery is going to die. There's wow. one remaining hatchery on the map. It's incredible. Uh, it's really, really nicely played by Mana, I've got to say. And this hatchery that's alive, by the way, is about mined out as well. So Mana has been warping it all over the place. It looks like that Fire Cake game really gave him some experience in dealing with this style. It absolutely did. And th that's what it is. It's just you have to have experience with the style. It looks so frustrating to play against, and it is genuinely very strong. But if you know how to deal with it, and you're in pretty good shape to begin with, you can. It feels uncomfortable. It feels like it shouldn't be this way. But if you just expand everywhere, you run around and counterattack, you never actually fight the Locusts. As long as you can make that happen, it's very beautiful. And Mana, he was looking a little bit shaky at first, but he, then he started making the right decisions for sure. Storm drop went on the gold base as well, taking that out. However, Blinding Cloud is coming down, and Snoot has forced that back. Some losses have been taken here by Mana. Needs to be careful. That's still a huge amount of Locusts. You cannot fight that army head-on. It's 41 Swarm Hosts worth of Locusts. It's just a massive number. There's 53 on the map right now. 101 on the map right now. He absolutely cannot fight this head-on. He can't get overconfident because he, he's getting the game in hand. Uh, Snoot has essentially no money left. There's not really a whole lot he can do, but he's that, like, that's just an absurd army left over. You cannot fight that head-on, and you cannot lose these units because Mana still doesn't have very much money of his own built yeah. up. He's only mining from 30 probes, which is really not helpful. I don't know. As good as this looking for Mana, and as excited as I was for him, I'm not sure if he's kind of getting himself backed into a corner here. He doesn't have a mothership core with him. He can't recall out. Uh, no, he might get trapped and might actually lose this army to Locust, which would be just absolutely terrible. The final mining base is actually going down here. Mana is focusing it down with those uh, plus three zealots and doing a great job of taking them out. You might want to consider something like shield upgrades here as well, considering. But regardless, there's another base going down for Mana as well. These, Sno these Snoot Locusts are doing very well. There's no mining bases remaining for the Protoss player here. And Snoot has actually retreated a lot of his swarm hosts while leaving some out there. If Mana actually recognizes that and pounces on it, he could get a bunch of, well, some, four, five free kills cleaning those out. Doesn't seem like he's aware of it, though. I'm not actually sure if it was a good idea for Mana to go back and play on the defensive. I think he should have just run around the map and play base race, because swarm hosts are really bad at base racing. 
from behind like that. I, th I think going back to defend was a bit of a misstep there. This is still a salvageable game though. He has a lot of Void Rays, he has a lot of high-tech army. He's gonna have a ton of storms because all those Templar have full mana now. And Snoot's actually pulling back into kind of a defensive position, which isn't so good. Uh, Mana's gonna be able to retake map control, start expanding, clear out some of this creep. He actually caught a bunch of the queens out there. Yeah, he didn't and, want to fight them. Uh, I think there were, there were a few too many. I think he would have lost a few Void Rays there. Yeah, those Locusts are about to dissipate. If he actually had his ground army in position, he could have jumped on that. But uh, Snoot gets back to safety in time. And Mana establishing one more final base. Yep. I don't know if he's going to be able to hold it. That Swarmhost army is just so, so powerful. I don't think he can defend. I think he has to base race and try and get pick offs and catch units out of position and fragmented and whatnot. Yeah, it's a really slow game of cat and mouse right now where his army is at the bottom, but unfortunately that's where the Locusts are going and he, he needs it to be the other way around. He needs to be at the top. He needs to have, say, you know, grab, use his Mothership Core to move his army very quickly and outmaneuver his opponent. That's uh, another base that gets popped there by the Void Ray Force, which is very nice, but... Uh, said this nexus is now starting to take some fire some pretty heavy fire there are all actually only five probes on the map so that nexus really only serves as a warping point at this stage he's not going to be mining much from it no not really and the thing is he actually has no money so he's not going to be able to put up another nexus most yeah. likely it's unlikely he's actually going to get more yeah. the minerals out of that nexus. Storm coming in uh, caught a couple of those templar at the back he's able to deal with that but he's he spent quite a lot of energy dealing with those locusts there's still 41 swarm host 80 locusts on the field the next wave comes in i'm really surprised that mana's trying to fight that i really am like it it seems like he's I, only going to lose units every time he does it i think he's kind of giving up at this point i think he feels like he just has to charge and go for it and if he doesn't he's going to lose no matter what now, i'm not sure that's entirely true Mm, that's force fair. He picks off a couple of queens for free. Mm. Playing Earth's style does make one want to hang themselves, but I this think that true. Mana does want to try and uh, get a handle on things. But he started to lose too many units, I feel. He's lost a couple of Void Rays, he's lost a couple of Templar here and there, his army supplies got a lot lower. On the plus side, he only has an army. It's, he has three probes left, so doesn't really make a huge amount of difference. The Void Ray comes around again, however, that means that he's going to lose two more Void Rays to the Obduct and not actually get the Hatchery. So he's being picked apart. Oh, three Void Rays to the Obduct. I that think is... Mana may have lost this at this point. I, I agree. You can't do that. The Void Rays are the most important part of this. He is finally swinging his army up around the map. Maybe looking for that base race, realizing that he can't just fight Locusts forever because the, the free units win in yes. that scenario. And he's actually just keep continuing to play defensively. I don't know what he expects to happen with that. Well, slow he death charge right. Yeah, that's what will happen. I don't know what he expects. Yeah. He's just looking for that. Like, he needed to charge across the map and get aggressive there. Yeah, he's, he's he now to starting that. to outmaneuver it, but the Colossus are caught at the back, and oh, Manor almost lost one. He actually recalls there. He actually there. recalled out. Yeah. Ugh, right back to his main. No, this is this is not working here for Mana now. And Snoot has re-established bases, lots of bases. He actually still has drones. He's up to 29 versus three probes. He's got 144 locusts on the field at that point, which is quite silly. Infestation pits being re-added. He's starting to build his tech back up. He's got his lair back up, building 13 drones here, because who needs units when you've got a bunch of free ones? And Mana is just sort of wandering around the map, slowly, aimlessly dying. He's like a zombie horde at this point. Yeah, this is a very frustrating position to be in for mana. It's kind of understandable that he looks a bit lost, but he doesn't want to leave the game. It's just... He, he absolutely could have, should have, would have won this game at a couple of different points. Yeah. The decision-making was just... It wasn't quite there. And now he's actually... Now he's in the corner. Yeah. Oh, this is only going to go one way. The, the Void Rays actually fight quite effectively there. He yonked a few too many Void Rays. The storms are coming in. He puts a storm down on those. I mean, he'd have to kill all of them to even stand a chance at this point, and he's losing Templar at the back here. I, I mean, this this is pretty much over. That it is. Just not enough stuff left to fight against the massive swarms of locusts he's getting every minute no. or two. Not at all. And in fact, Snoot's just going to march right at it. Loses a few swarmers in the process. If Snoot threw the game from this position, that would have been... I don't think it's physically possible. I, he has I don't think so. No, there's, there's no way. And Mana understands. Yeah, he's, he's killing his main locust more so out of spite than anything else, I feel, at this point. And he's on 28 supply. Now is the time to leave the game, Mana. You know, you've, you've proven your point. It's just time to go. You're not going to win this, I'm afraid. No. Um, still sticking around. Still looking for something. He yeah. has a couple of Void Rays doing harassment over the natural. So that is his last hope. 
want to call it 20, that. 23 army supply to 147. So, He's up to 27 now. Yeah. So anything, anything goes here in this game. Anything could possibly happen in the next few minutes. It's understandable. It was a very frustrating game. He certainly could have won it, but yep. it, he made mistakes. He made bad attacks. He made bad decisions. And as annoying as Swarmhost Turtle is, it shouldn't even have gotten to that point. If he had done yeah. it well, he would have killed him. And there's the GG. Any GGs. Yep. A little bit too late. That was unfortunate. You're absolutely right. Like when he, w he went around and started tearing the bases apart, that was absolutely fantastic. And then at that point, he should have gone, as as you said, for the committed base race. Find out where the swarm hosts are, go where they aren't, and then go mm -hmm. for it. But Absolutely. that didn't happen. And then he just, he died slowly over the course of 30 minutes. Yeah, and even before that, like, he should have gone for the base race once the swarm host turtle was established. But he could have killed him at least twice before that. His initial attack was way too early. Like, he saw Roach laying and he charged into the middle of it anyway. And then after that, he was still in the game. And he won a very solid defense against the Roach Hydra Viper. There he had another opportunity to go kill him as he was trying to switch into Swarm Hosts. Because the Swarm Hosts were basically panic at that point. He had nothing else that was like a fallback. Well, let's pray and make these and hope it works out. And he, he just gave him the time to get it set up. Then he didn't respond to it properly in time. He didn't start establishing expansions or doing any kind of base racing or harassment until it was far too late. It's really unfortunate because he had, he had everything he needed to win and... In the end, he clearly showed that he knew how to play against it. He just didn't commit to it early enough uh, or hard enough. Well, that's that. Yes. Bit of a, a fizzle on the last game there. It was it was going pretty well for a while, but the last 20 minutes did get a little depressing, I have to say. But, well, Poland, one of the strongest competitors, unfortunately is not able to make it happen. And Norway, again, a bit of a surprise, is able to make it through to day three. Yeah. I'd still say that uh, Ike, Ike was the, the story of today. Yeah, that was he played really quite well. a breakout performance. No, I don't think anyone had ever heard of him, much less seen him play or considered him a real contender against this caliber of player. Uh, and then he just comes out and he goes, what, four and two, five and two, and beats players like Happy. Makes Die Star look pretty bad, honestly. His ZVP, definitely a little bit questionable. Oh, he beat Mana as well. Very impressive performance from him. And then, of course, nice by Snoot to pull out, I don't know, his early game there looked really, really questionable. And then his mid game looked really, really questionable. But he, he stuck with it, he showed great tenacity, and he pulled it out and when it really mattered for his team, or for his country. Absolutely. Well, there you go. Norway will advance to day three alongside Russia, which was perhaps the more expected result. And Spain and Poland are eliminated from the nation wars. Now, tomorrow... You can tune in at exactly the same time, which I believe is 11 a.m. EST. That is 8 a.m. on the Pacific West Coast. That would be 4 p.m. in the British Isles GMT, 5 p.m. Central European Time, and 6 p.m. Eastern European Time. So if you do that, you will find yet more of this. We've got another group stage, so five best of fives tomorrow. That will actually not be with Greg. It will be myself and Day9 casting that one. So Greg is probably happy for the break after that rather lengthy <laughs> session. And the teams will be, we're going to have the Ukraine, we're going to have France, we're going to have Sweden, and we're going to have Germany. And Sweden, funnily enough, Sweden's lineup is actually the one that looks the weakest, which is weird because you wouldn't expect that. But it is lacking some key players. Let's just put it that way, because there was some unfortunate drama surrounding the Swedish recruitment, which has resulted in Bishu, Moro, and Zanster being the lineup. That's still a competent lineup. Bishu and Moro are capable of taking games off anyone. But yeah, normally you'd expect Sweden to be a powerhouse. And as is, I don't know if they quite live up to that title. I, not anymore. I don't think so. But and it's unfortunate that that went down the way that it did. But regardless, Bishu can take games off anyone. I would never underestimate Bishu. Moro, of course, has been around forever. Zanster, I have not had the opportunity to watch, but who knows? He He's apparently a very young Zerg player who's mm -hmm. considered promising by some, at least. I've All never right. seen him play either. All right. Well, I think we have been on air quite long enough, thankfully. <laughs> That's, that, was, <laughs> that was enough. I have encoded 1.02 million frames of video. I have dropped zero frames. And we have sent 12.75 gigabytes of StarCraft in your general direction. So that's how things have gone today. We have been on the air now for a ten, ten, ten and hours. And a half hours. Give or take ten hours. Which I think is quite long enough. So I'm going to hope that people are still available for delivery. Because I can't be asked to cook after that. So uh, that was lengthy. We'll be doing it all again tomorrow, folks. 
And I am going to sign off right now. You can watch the VODs. I, they should be up by tomorrow, I think. It'll take us a little while to cut and edit those VODs, but they should be going in then. Of course, if you're subscribed, then the VODs are already available. So you'll be able to check them out on the Twitch TV VOD section there. Of course, day three will be the finals. That, I believe, will be two best of fives and the best of seven. So a little bit of a shorter day there. All right. That's that. Thank you very much to O Gaming for organizing the Nation Wars, and a big thanks to the sponsors Daily Motion and Numeric, and also, of course, to Mr. Greg Fields for spending his entire day here with us. Oh, thank you for having me. I like I said, Nation Wars back in Brood War, they're bread and butter. I'm happy to be a part of another one. Yeah, it's cool to see, and always nice to see a few upsets, which we certainly got here, and actually see a few breakout players. Hopefully, we get the same tomorrow. We'll see whether or not the reign of Todd will begin. I hope so. I dearly <laughs> hope so. My name is Total Biscuits here, casting with Greg Fields for Nation Wars O Gaming. Thank you very much for watching, folks, and we will see you tomorrow.